Sergeants, can we please start the recordings? You see recording done. Backup is rolling. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. At this time, we ask that council members and council staff please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place cell phones and electronic devices to silent or vibrate. If you have a testimony you wish to submit, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Mr. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, uh, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I am joined remotely today by uh, Council Members Gredenchek, Rose, uh, Levin, I saw uh, Borelli, Ayala, uh, and I believe we have uh, the speaker on as well. Uh, before we begin, uh, I note that LU number 834 on today's agenda for the Windermere proposal will be laid over. Uh, today we will hold public hearings on the 62-04 Roosevelt Avenue rezoning and the 48-18 Van Dam Teamsters rezoning, both relating to property located in Queens, the uh, 495 11th Avenue rezoning in Manhattan, the 1776 48 Street rezoning and the 270 Nordstrom Avenue rezoning, uh, both relating to property located in Brooklyn, and the 252 Victory Boulevard and River North rezoning proposals, both relating to property in Staten Island. But first, uh, we will vote on a number of items heard by the subcommittee at our September 10th meeting. We will vote to approve LUs number 832 and 833 for the 2840 Knapp Street rezoning proposal relating to property in Council District 48 in Brooklyn. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change an R5 district to an R6 district and a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and option two. We will also file pursuant a letter of withdrawal and in accordance with the Council Rule 11.6 OBLU number 8 36 and 837 for the 629 639 West 142nd Street rezoning proposal. On September 23rd, uh, 2021, the applicant submitted a letter of withdrawal of the application. We will also vote to approve with modifications LU, numbers, uh, LU number 838 for a citywide zoning text amendment proposed by the Department of City Planning and the MTA known as Zoning for Accessibility or ZFA. The proposal would establish a system-wide easement requirement uh, requiring developers of transit adjacent sites to first obtain a determination as to the need for easement volumes to facilitate future station access. And it will also create an expanded authorization framework for the uh, transit improvement floor area bonus program, expanding the area of applicability to all R9 and R10 districts citywide and applying the program to a larger radius for eligible sites. Our modifications would include adding the city council to the list of recipients of the MTA's annual report for the easement program, would clarify the resiliency measures in conjunction with accessibility improvements, would be among the allowable types of station upgrades, and would establish a maximum threshold for additional floor area for sites under the proposed uh, authorization mechanism. We'll also vote to approve LU's number 839 for the 10602 Rockaway Boulevard, uh, Rockaway Beach Boulevard rezoning proposal relating to property in council member Ulrich's district in Queens. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change an R5D uh, C23 district to an M15 district. Council member Ulrich is in support of the proposal. And finally, we will also vote to approve LU numbers uh, 840 and 841 for the 307 Kent Avenue rezoning proposal relating to property in council member Levin's district in Brooklyn. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change an M31 district uh, partially to an M15 district and partially to an M14 R6A special mixed use district, as well as a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area in the special mixed use uh, district portion uh, of the rezoning area. However, approval will facilitate a new nine-story primary, 
primarily commercial and community facility building. Council member 11 is in support of the proposal. Um, and now uh, I'll take the opportunity to uh, recognize any of the local members uh, who may want to say remarks uh, before our vote. Council, do we have any, any members that uh, are looking to speak before the vote? Chair Council Member Levin has a uh, hand raised. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I just want to quickly um, acknowledge the um, longstanding work that the applicant at 307 Kent Avenue put into this proposal. Um, uh, this was an application um, from um, uh, uh, two partners who have long ties to this piece of property going back generations. Um, both of their parents uh, owned um, uh, the property um, before them. So they, these are, um, I do believe, um, uh, individuals who have the best interest of um, Williamsburg um, at heart and want to do the right thing. And um, this was a, um, a very... Um, uh, manageable process in terms of negotiations and the outcome that we found um, suitable is that this will be a ground up commercial development um, with the um, increased FAR. Um, there will be a set aside of 10% uh, of the commercial FAR for below market um, uh, rents at uh, no more than 75% of the market rate. Um, uh, the, uh, the owners of the property now have agreed to not develop, uh, lease, or uh, knowingly sell the property um, to somebody to develop it into self-storage um, that we felt was the important, but also the 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 best mechanism that we we had to ensure that 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 um, does not become an outcome um, in the instance that they um, sell the property, um, and um, and then there are uh, uh, certain sustainability measures that they have agreed to take um, as part of the development of this parcel. So, um, with that, I just want to. Um, I uh, encourage my colleagues to vote aye and um, once again, thank the applicants for their working with us in good faith. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I now call for a vote to file pursuant uh, to letter of withdrawal LUs uh, 836 and 837 to remove them from our calendar to approve LUs 832, 833, 839, 840, and 841, and to approve with the modifications I have described LU 838. Uh, Council, uh, please call the roll. Chair Moya. I vote aye. Council Member Levin. Vote aye. Council Member Gradenchik. Aye. Uh, come back to Council Member Gradenchik. Council Member Ayala. Aye. Council Member Borelli. Council Member uh, Grodenchik. I am sorry about that. It's not quite all right. Uh, Council Member Borelli. Council Member Bradley, can you hear me? If you can hear me, uh, raise your hand. Chair, we appear to be having a technical issue with Council Member Borelli's audio. Um, so I think we can come back to him. The vote currently stands at four in the affirmative. 
uh, and zero and the negative with no abstentions at the moment and the vote will remain open uh, with your permission. Yep, absolutely. In that case, uh, as soon as we have word that we can sort out uh, Councilmember Morelli, we can move to the remote meeting procedures. Okay. I'll make that announcement here if that's all right with you. Yes. Uh, hey guys, I so am. Oh. Excuse me, Council Member Morelli on a vote of the land use items. I own all, I apologize. It's okay. Chair, the vote is currently five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with no abstentions. We will continue to leave the vote open. Yeah, and with that, um, I am Arthur Ha, Council to this subcommittee. Members of the public were asked to testify uh, for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the New York City Council website, www.council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Members of the public may also view a live stream broadcast of this meeting at the council's website. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, you may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first, followed by members of the public. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your microphone is on before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit instead of appearing here before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear at the bottom of your participant panel. Council members with questions will be announced in the order as they raise their hands and Chair Moyo will recognize members to speak. Witnesses are requested to remain in the meeting until excused by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting for various technical reasons and we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. Chair Moyo will now continue with today's agenda items. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Um, before we begin uh, with our hearings, I also would like to take this opportunity to uh, uh, wish uh, Council Member uh, Ayala a very happy birthday today. Uh, hope you have a good day. And what better way to spend your birthday than uh, with the Zoning and Franchising uh, Committee? So happy Yay. birthday, Councilwoman. Uh, I will now recognize the subcommittee council to uh, review procedures, uh, which you just did. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> And uh, now I open the public hearing on uh, LU numbers uh, 852 and 853 for the 6204 Roosevelt Avenue rezoning proposal seeking zoning map and zoning text amendments and relating to property in Council Member Van Bramer's district in Queens. Uh, I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you've not already done so, uh, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the Council's website. Um, Council, if you can please call up the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Lisa Arantia, Nic Nicola Iravasi, Shiva Gomi, Kevin Albert, Richard Winslow, Paula Duran, Jordan Press, Stacy Liago, and Silas Levitt. Thank you, um, panelists. Council, if you can please uh, administer the affirmation. Panelists, please write, raise your right hands and state your name for the record. Lisa Orantia. Jordan Press. Nicola Yervasi. Kevin Albert. Shiba Gomi. 
I also love it. I, I, I'm not, not sure I heard everybody, but panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm, you tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you, uh, um, council. Uh, when you are ready um, to present your slideshow, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff, and slides will be advanced for you uh, when you say next. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would please restate your names and organizations for the record, uh, you may begin. Uh, good morning, my name is Lisa Orantia from Ackerman LLP, uh, Land Use Council on behalf of Woodside 63 Management LLC. Um, should I begin the presentation? You can begin. Thank you. Uh, can we start with slide one, please? Good morning. Again, my name is Lisa Orantia, Land Use Counsel from Ackerman LLP. Uh, thank you for your time today. Um, Steve Weischer from Woodside 63 Management LLC couldn't join us here today, but we are joined by co-applicant uh, Mara Nostrum Elements, um, as well as other applicant members. Uh, the proposed zoning and text amendments will allow the development of a 13-story mixed-use building um, in Community District 2 in Woodside, Queens. Um, it will include a new home for Mara Nostrum, um, a Woodside-based nonprofit arts, performing arts organization, and additional space for other community artists. Next slide, please. The site is located at a transit hub and it's bounded by Roosevelt Avenue and the elevated seven line, 63rd Street and the Long Island Railroad tracks in Woodside, Queens. Next slide, please. The site is currently improved with one and two story commercial buildings that were constructed before 1960 and there are no residential or community facility uses at the site. Next slide, please. The proposal is to change the R6 and R6 with C14 overlay <clears throat> district to a C44 district and designate a mandatory inclusionary housing area that uh, will be mapped for options one and two, coterminous with the rezoning area. These actions will allow a moderate increase in density at a transit hub to facilitate new development that will improve housing opportunities for the area's growing population. It will include permanently affordable housing units, um, and it will increase community facility offerings by, it, by adding uh, affordable performing arts space. Um, next slide, please. And Shiva Gomi from Outgang Architects will present the following slides. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, for presenting this application today. My name is Shiva Gomi. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development at Offking Architects. Um, as you can see in the slide, and, and Lisa mentioned, the proposed building is a 13-story high building. Uh, we aim for a high-quality architectural design uh, for this development. And um, we, the, the aim and the goal was to be respectful as much as possible to the community's character. Uh, the proposed setbacks that you can see in the renderings um, are you know, the, the, our, the goal of it is to make the building more attractive and mitigate the, um, the impact of the overall size of the development and uh, also to create some sort of open spaces, open balconies and terraces. Um, the proposed development is just over um, 210,000 square feet and it will contain 516 um, accessory parkings that are required by um, zoning codes and also 213 dwelling units that 54 of them are going to be permanently affordable 
um, the performing arts space will take up approximately 7,500 square feet uh, in the cellar area. And um, there's gonna be local retail you know, on the ground floor as well. Next slide, please. Um, this project uh, features sustainability um, criteria and principles that we're following. There's gonna be proposed green roof and solar, solar panels on the roof, uh, high efficiency heating and cooling system, uh, low flow plumbing features, um, air sealing and insulation and hard, high performance windows. Um, there's gonna be energy saving appliances uh, implemented into the uh, project. Uh, we're gonna be mindful of reducing off-gassing VOC materials um, to improve the quality of the, um, the indoor air quality. Um, the efficient air, air circulation with um, you know, high efficiency HVAC system is gonna be proposed. And as I mentioned, there's, there's gonna be um, second floor terraces and also third floor uh, open space for the residents to have access to. Next please. Um, the entrances for the parking area, art space, um, residential, and a uh, portion of the commercial and retail on the ground floor are all located on 63rd Street. And um, additional commercial um, access and entrances, as you can see on the, on the site plan, are going to be provided on Roosevelt Avenue. Next, please. Um, Based on the feedback that we received by the community board, we increased the number of um, uh, family units, twos and threes, um, in the proposed dueling unit um, unit count. And as you can see on on the on this slide, we're going to have forty one studios, one hundred one one bedrooms, sixty two bedrooms, and eleven three bedroom units. Next, please. Okay, I pass it to Nicola and Kevin um, to talk to you about the, the performing arts space. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for the opportunity to present this project. My name is Kevin Albert and I'm here with Nicole Irvasi. We are co-artistic directors and co-founders of Mar and Instrum Elements. The entire arts node will be, as it was mentioned, approximately 7,500 square feet, of which our organization will have 2,000 square feet to use for rehearsals, performances and classes and to make available to alumni of our main program, the Emerging Choreographer Series, and to the general dance and theater public for deeply affordable hourly rentals of 10 to $15 an hour. So if you see on the, uh, on the top left and bottom left, ME1 and ME2, those are two studios that we're gonna have. Um, the Arts Node will also include a 2000 square foot, that's the CA space to the right of our ME number one, uh, to be made available to individual artists, performing artists and small entities at 10 to $15 an hour from the get-go Queens Com Art, which is a newly formed nonprofit, will run this space and will benefit from the, from the vast pool of dancers, teachers, choreographers, and theater makers connected to our organization. The Arts Node will also include five smaller studios to be made available at deeply affordable rates to performing and visual artists for shorter or long-term uh, rentals. The main lobby of the Arts Node uh, will be used as an art gallery exhibiting the works made in the space. Um, the developer has agreed uh, to offer us a column free space with 12 foot clearance. This is very important for legitimate dance. We're gonna have legitimate dance here in Queens. Um, also the, the uh, developer has agreed to um, give us a sprung wood dance floor. This is very helpful for an organization like us. Um, also communal restrooms, you'll see the bottom right, restrooms, that's for all of the spaces so that none of the artists have to dig into their own studios to build restrooms. Um, the, uh, the developer has also agreed to a blade sign in Roosevelt directing the public to the entrance and a mural by a local artist, Zihan Wazed, that is visible from the train. Um, we thank Councilman Van Bramer for all of his support and for connecting us to this project. And we have faith in this development team. They've been very responsive to all of our suggestions to follow through on their promises to see this advancement in the arts in Queens thrive. And thank you once again uh, for allowing us this opportunity. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the project was refined over the course of several meetings with the community board, and we're happy to have this strong support from both the community board and borough president as a result of this collaboration. Um, some of the highlights we'd like to identify for you 
um, are assigned MOU with the co-applicant regarding this, the 7,500 square feet of space to be used for community arts, um, attractive signage on the corner of Roosevelt and 63rd Street, uh, a change from MIH option two in the initial application to option one, um, plus there's a commitment to provide additional affordable units. Um, that will get us to 30% of residential floor area reserved for houses for households earning 60% uh, AMI. Um, <clears throat> there's also a completed agreement with 32 BJ so that prevailing wage jobs with benefits are available to the permanent um, building service employees, electric vehicle charging stations and car share spaces are included in the building, um, will be included as well as uh, New York City Mesh, which will provide an independent, fast, reliable internet connection, accessible to all New Yorkers. Um, next slide, please. So local nonprofit, HANIC, will administer the affordable units and handle the marketing and lease-up process. Um, and the owner will work with local organizations like Woodside on the Move, as well as the community board and elected officials to advertise the availability of the residential units. Next slide, please. Um, storage for 116 bicycles will be included as required by the zoning resolution. And in response to the community board's um, strong interest in providing support for um, alternatives to car travel, the owner intends to partner with UNI, which is a local company that designs attractive and secure bicycle storage structures um, for both inside and outside the building. Uh, next slide, please. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just have one uh, quick question. Um, do you have a plan in place to address the local hiring uh, during construction um, generally? And, and how do you respond to some of the uh, borough president's recommendations around jobs specifically? We don't have a GC hired yet. <clears throat> um, there is agreement, as I said, with 32BJ for the permanent building service employees. Um, and construction is uh, planned on being a mix of union and non-union non labor. Okay. Okay, that's it for me. Um, and I want to invite uh, my colleagues uh, to ask any questions. If you have any questions uh, for the applicant panel, please use the raise hand button. Council, do we have any council members uh, with questions? Chair Council Member Grodenchik has a hand raised for a question. You're up, Barry G. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to talk, uh, ask a question to the gentleman who presented on the arts. Um, is that going to be permanent for the life of the building? How, how is that enshrined into what we're talking about today? Um, Jordan, would you like to talk to that or would you like me to respond? Um, I you, uh, uh, oh, sorry. I, I, I was going to suggest, Kevin, if you guys want to just, to, you know, you can describe the length of the agreement that you have at this point. Yeah, right, right now we've been offered a 10-year lease and we are um, in conversations to find out a way to make it in perpetuity. Um, at this present moment, we don't have that agreement in place. Um, but I do see a willingness to continue talking about that. We've reached out to other organizations um, with Steve Leischer to, uh, that are doing similar things or trying to do similar things, to try to find a way to keep it in perpetuity uh, to match the, you know, the increase of building size, which will also be in perpetuity. Um, but right now we don't have an agreement beyond uh, a 10 year lease. And, um, but like I said, we are still negotiating and working out some of those details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Council Member Grudenchik. Are there uh, any other council members with questions? Uh, no, Chair, I see no other members with questions at this time. Okay. 
Uh, there being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, council, are there uh, any members of the public who wish to testify on the 6204 Roosevelt Avenue rezoning application? Yes, Chair Moya, we have approximately three uh, public witnesses who have signed up to speak. Okay. For members of the public uh, here to testify, please note again that witnesses will generally be called in panels. If you are a member of the public signed up to testify uh, on this item, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the chair says that you may begin. And please note again that once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed from the meeting as a group and the next group of speakers will be announced. Once removed, you may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing at the council website. And we will now hear from the first panel, which will include Renzo Ramirez and Katharina Gio Gionio. And my apologies for that. Uh, first speaker, Renzo uh, Ramirez. Starting time. Uh, just a quick reminder to the members of the public, you'll be given two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has uh, started the clock. Um, and now you may begin. Starting time. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Renzo Ramirez and I am a representative of 32BJ and a Queens resident. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service union representing 85,000 property service workers across the city. We represent workers who maintain, clean, and provide security services in buildings like the one being discussed at 6204 Roosevelt Avenue. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. I am happy to report that the developers affiliated with this project have made a credible commitment to creating prevailing wage building service jobs at this site. Their commitment is an investment in Queens by providing wages and benefits that give working families opportunity for upward mobility and economic security. We estimate that this rezoning, which will allow the construction of 213 units, including 64 permanently affordable units, will lead to the creation of four new cleaning jobs. We are in support of this project and we, we are confident that the developers will be a responsible employer and have positive, will have positive presence in the community. For these reasons, we respectfully urge you to approve this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. We have the next panelist ready. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Starting to time. Oh, sorry. No, you can start. It's okay. All right. Uh, hi there, I'm Katarina Gimino. I'm the head of community partnerships and advocacy for UNI. As a born and raised Queens resident uh, coming from a low income single mom, I don't need to explain how necessary this building's partnership with UNI is so inclusive and necessary. UNI provides free bicycle parking to everyone uh, and it will be providing a needed and unfortunately lacking service in our city's infrastructure. Uh, UNI is a black and brown owned company that will provide over 1500 secure bicycle parking spaces that are free again uh, for all New Yorkers and New Jerseyans who happen to live near a location or happen to pass by. And that's just a drop in the bucket given how only one in four, how given how one in four households in New York have had their bikes, uh, their bikes stolen in the last five years. Uh, given the 6204's location to both several subway stops and an LIR station, it, having a secure bicycle parking location for both people living in this area, as well as commuters and a major asset, or will provide commuters a major asset to both Queens and the city. We are in support of this project, and I know that my team and I are very excited to work with the group behind this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, that was the last speaker for the okay. first panel. Okay. Uh, do we have any council members who have any questions for this panel? Oh, Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Uh, there being uh, no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. All right, if there are any members of the public 
who yet wish to testify on the 6204 Roosevelt Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will stand at ease briefly while we also check for any newly registered members uh, of the public. Chair, it appears we, we may have an additional speaker. Okay. So working on getting that uh, settled. Is there a Peter Chu uh, present in the meeting and seeking to testify on this item on the 6204 Roosevelt Avenue proposal? Peter Chu, if you can hear us, please uh, raise your hand. We're working on getting him, uh, getting the next speaker in. Here, just uh, finalizing, we did get a word that there was possibly an additional speaker. So we're still working out that uh, technical detail.
Okay, Chair, my apologies. Um, I, I don't think we were able to uh, resolve whether there was another speaker or, and or there may be technical difficulties. I'll take this reminder to remind all of the viewing public that anyone wishing to submit written testimony may do so by sending an email to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And with that chair, um, uh, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify. Great, thank you, Arthur. Uh, there being no uh, other members of the public who wish to testify on LU numbers 852 and 853 for the 6204 Roosevelt Avenue rezoning proposal, uh, the public hearing on uh, these items is now closed and they are laid over. I now open the public hearing on LU number 863 for the 48-18 Van Dam Teamsters rezoning proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment and relates to property in council member Van Bramer's district in Queens. I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, uh, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. Um, council, if you can please uh, call the first panel for this item. Sorry, Chair, one, one moment, please. Yep. Uh, the first, uh, the applicant panel for this item will include Eric Palatnik, Land Use Counsel for the applicant, and Sean Campbell on behalf of the applicant. Panelists, please raise your right hands and state your name for the record. Eric Palatnik. Sean Campbell. Thank you. Do you uh, affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, just as a reminder, when you're ready to present your slideshow, uh, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Uh, once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would please uh, restate uh, your names and organizations for the record, uh, you may begin. Eric Palatnik, land use attorney representing Teamsters Local 813. Uh, good morning, Sean Campbell, uh, representing uh, Local 813. 4818 Van Dam Street Holdings, uh, property holdings. And we are ready for presentation, uh, Chair Moya. Thank you. Thank you to members of the council and the committee for spending the time on this and for your continued dedication to New York City. My name is Eric Palatnik. It's a pleasure to be before you for a rezone uh, for the property at 4818 Van Dam Street. Next slide, please. The rezoning, if it were to be approved, uh, you could switch to the next slide if possible. And the rezoning, if it were to be approved, would rezone the block front that you see here from an M21 district to an M15 district. It would facilitate the enlargement of the existing two-story building that the Teamsters have substantially invested in and allow for a four-story enlargement of the building to create a Teamsters base building to include local 813, as well as other unions within the Long Island City community that may need an office. There's a strong demand for union space with record keeping and meeting rooms and ample parking, none of which already exists in the Long Island City area. And Sean and his organization are anxious to expand the building. Next slide, please. You can see the site here in more detail. Next slide. You can see some imagery here of the existing building. Sean and his organization have redeveloped an old factory warehouse building, and they are currently located there right now. And as I'm talking, you can just click through the next four or five slides, please, to give the viewing audience a chance to see what the property looks like. It is this building that we would ask to put four stories on top of. And you can click to the end of the photographs, please. It should take you to page nine. 
This shows you page nine, uh, which shows you the proposed zoning map. It's page nine on the next slide, please. Shows you the proposed rezoning, which is on the left side, the existing zoning at M21. You could stop there. You can go ahead to that next slide, please. That's fine. I could talk. And it would rezone the site to an M15, as you see on the right side. Next slide, please. This imagery shows you the addition the Teamsters wish to, wish to add to the building. You can see on the left side of the building, the garage door entrances, that would be the space for off-street accessory parking, voluntary. It's necessary for the Teamsters when they have meetings of their organization, the members need to come and vote and they need to do other business within the building. And of course, New York City, Long Island City parking is a premium. I'd also like to pay special attention to the park that's at the left corner there of that imagery. That'll be a pocket park that the Teamsters have signed a restrictive declaration and have agreed to create there, which will be a nice addition uh, to this otherwise concrete corner of uh, Van Damme Street. Next slide, please. The next few images I'll just click through rather quickly, but it shows you what the building is proposed to lay out. Uh, I'll call out some special attention to the conference rooms, the large meeting rooms, the off-street parking, off-street bicycle parking, uh, and ample circulation for vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. That is, uh, I can provide you, actually, I didn't realize you put an appendix here. I could show you the remainder of the plans if you'd like, but I think it's probably best if I stop here and open it up to any questions and give anybody any time to speak. I'd also like to call out that the community board did vote to support the application as did Councilman Von Bramer indicated support so far. I'll let him speak for himself, I believe he's here. And also the borough president voted in support of it. Uh, we've also met with numerous local community groups uh, and Sean has a longstanding relationship with LaGuardia Community College for a young intern program that he could speak to as well, as well as his commitment to arts and promoting that within the building as much as he can. Thank you very much for giving us the time to speak. Thank you. Um, just to, I know you might have mentioned it before, uh, Eric, and I'm sorry. Uh, have you incorporated any of the community board or the borough president's recommendation uh, on onto the proposal? Uh, well, the community boards, most of the community board's recommendations, uh, well, we've included a lot of the community board's recommendations. Let me start there. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about bicycle parking and off-street bicycle parking. That's been included within the proposal. Uh, Sean has spent extensive amount of time meeting with the, uh, there's a rather strong uh, cultural arts uh, dedication in Long Island City. It's, it's, it's sort of the, cult, the arts hub of, of New York. And uh, Sean has met with uh, the, the Arts Committee of Community Board 2, as well as with some other local artists, and has agreed, I'll let him speak to the agreement he's made. Uh, they can't promise any art space officially because they're a union and as such they have a fiduciary responsibility to their members and that doesn't include being an art gallery. Having said that they have a strong love of art and I'll let Sean explain the personal commitments they have made to the community to allow art to be displayed within the building and uh, any vacant storefronts and things to that effect. Uh, so we have done our best to uh, accommodate the community's concerns. The final thing I believe they asked for were electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, we could not accommodate those on the site, uh, the engineering and, and, and the intricacies and the, the levels of, of work that need to accomplish that are beyond the, uh, the abilities of the Teamsters right now as they're under extreme duress due to COVID in getting their union fund and getting the building actually constructed. Uh, but everything else that was asked for, uh, they fully desire to comply with. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, now I want to see if uh, any of my colleagues have any questions um, for this panel. Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 48-18 Van Dam team presenting application? If there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 48-18 Van Dam Teamsters rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now for the 48-18 Van Dam Teamsters rezoning proposal. The meeting will very briefly stand at ease uh, while we check on members of the public.
Chair Moya, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay. Uh, there being uh, no other members of the public who wish to testify on LU numbers uh, 863 for the 48-18 Van Dam Teamsters rezoning proposal, the public hearing is now closed and this item is laid over. Okay, uh, I now want to uh, open the public hearing on LU numbers uh, 861 and 862 for the 1776 48th Street rezoning proposal, uh, requesting zoning map and zoning text amendments and relating to property in Council Member Yeager's district in Brooklyn. Uh, once again, anyone wishing to testify on this item who has not already registered online must do so now by, vis by visiting the Council's uh, website to sign up. Uh, Council, can you please call the first panel for this item? The applicant panel for this item chair will include uh, Eric Palatnik, Land Use Council. Uh, for the applicant, Mr. Palatnik, I will remind you that you uh, remain under oath. Thank you very much for the reminder and thank you very much again to the committee for making the time to hear from me again. And I'm happy to report we've been busy during COVID trying to get things moving. So this is, thank you very much for taking the time to hear it. Uh, this application is another well-supported applicant. I'm happy to be here with the support of the community board and I believe of the councilman as well uh, to support a rezoning of 18th Avenue from what is R5 to R6B. Next slide, please. Uh, you could see the imagery or pull up the presentation. You could see on the screen that's about to be shared. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. The proposal is to redevelop an existing building that sits at the corner with this building that you're seeing right here. If approved, it would allow for a three-story building that would have five dwelling units. It would be approximately 8,000 square feet and it would have ground floor commercial. Next slide, please. Some more imagery so you can see what it would look like. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. You can see here the block front on which the property is located is a commercial block front. Yet despite being commercial block front, right now it's zoned purely R5. You'll notice a large school across the street as well as a multiple dwelling across the street, which is rather at odds with its R5 zoning right now. So the request is to make it an R6B zoning district. It should also be noted that we have the support of all of the neighbors around us. Next slide, please. It shows you the site in greater detail and shows you, you can see right here on this map, how this is the only block front on the entire block that doesn't have a commercial overlay. Uh, it's somewhat at odds with the remainder of the block. Next slide, please. The proposed zoning district change is depicted here. Again, you can see on the left side how this is the only block front without a commercial overlay. And you can see that it is staunchly within an R5 district, although the as-built conditions, pardon the interruption, the as-built conditions are larger than an R5 and rather more similar to an R6B, which is the request. Next slide, please. This just shows you the zoning change in greater detail. Uh, I'd like to pause the presentation here. I know you have a busy agenda. I believe I've shown you a lot of what we're proposing and I'd like to open it up for any questions or to go through any more of the application in greater detail uh, should the committee desire. Uh, I have no questions uh, for the applicant. Uh, council, do we have any council members who wish to ask any questions on this item? Chair, I see no members with uh, questions for this item. 
Okay, there being no further questions, the uh, applicant panel is uh, excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 48th Street rezoning application? There are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 48th Street rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for uh, any members of the public chair. Chair, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, there being uh, no other members of the public who wish to testify on the LU numbers uh, 861 and 862 for the 1776 48th Street rezoning proposal. Uh, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Okay, uh, I now open the public hearing on LU numbers uh, 854, 855, 856 for the uh, 49.5 11th Avenue rezoning proposal, uh, requesting zoning map and zoning text amendments and a related site section and acquisition action relating to property in uh, Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan. Uh, once again, anyone wishing to uh, testify on this item who has not already registered online must do so now by visiting the council's website. Um, I wanna uh, take a moment right now to see if uh, we have the speaker on or. Okay. We're gonna go um, to the applicant first. So uh, council, if you can please call the first panel uh, for this item. Chair, the applicant panel for this item will include Lisa Arantia, land use counsel for the applicant, Will Fisher for EDC, Jonathan Butler, Joe DiGenova uh, for the developer, Dan Kaplan, Ben Abelman for the uh, architect, Sunita Amal Raj, EDC, Brooke Wiskorek, EDC, COVID Saxena, Sam Schwartz, and Lauren George uh, representing the applicant. That's a lot of names, but if you could all uh, raise your right hands and state your name for the record. Daniel Kaplan. Will Fisher. Sunita, 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 I do see uh, Jonathan Butler. Panelists, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, when you're ready to go through your slide presentation, please uh, say so. It will be displayed on screen and slides will be advanced for you by our staff when you say next. Once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. 
Now, if the panelists would uh, please uh, restate your name, organization for the record, you may begin. Hi, good morning. We're uh, ready for the slides. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm Will Fisher, Assistant Vice President, uh, Government Community Relations at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, EDC. Uh, today, I'm pleased to introduce the 495 11th Avenue project on behalf of the entire development team. Uh, this project secures much needed affordable housing in a transit and amenity rich part of Manhattan. In addition to providing other valuable economic development programming that will add to New York City's resurgence from COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, the applicant for this project is 495 11th Avenue Owner Realty LLC, a joint venture of Radson Development and Kings Point Heights, together with EDC. For the site selection and acquisition action, the applicants are the New York City Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, and the New York City Police Department. The applicant representative is EDC. Next slide. Uh, this project has reached today's milestone as the result of advocacy by Speaker Corey Johnson and Manhattan Community Board 4, and I would like to thank each of them on behalf of the entire team for their partnership and collaboration. To activate the site at the community's recommendation, EDC released an RFP in 2015, selecting the development team that's here before you in 2017. Uh, over the last six years, the team has worked closely with Community Board 4 to make changes to the proposal in direct response to their input, resulting in an overwhelming vote of support earlier this year. We cannot have reached this stage without their hard work and want to thank them once again. But this proposal includes the goals, which you see here on the page, of maximizing affordable housing with cross subsidy for commercial use, not using city subsidy, providing a range of income levels of, for affordable housing, accommodating the existing NYPD parking on site, and incorporating a grocery store. Our team is proud to have accomplished each of these goals. And for more detail, I am pleased to introduce Lisa Arantia from Ackerman. Lisa. And next slide. Thank you, Will. Uh, good morning, Lisa Orantia from Ackerman LLP, Land Use Council for 495 11 Avenue Owner LLC, Realty LLC. Uh, thank you to the committee for hearing this application today. The site is located on 11th Avenue uh, between West 39th Street and West 40th Street in Hell's Kitchen, Community District 4, Manhattan. The, cut, the site is currently owned, uh, zoned M15, and it's located west of the Special Hudson Yards District. Next slide, please. The site's lot area is just under 25,000 square feet, and it's surrounded by Javits Convention Center structures and transportation uses. Next slide, please. The site is unimproved and has been used for NYPD vehicle parking since 1993. The Lincoln Tunnel entrance ramp is located across the street from the site. To the west is a garage for the Javits Center. North of the site is uh, on 40th Street is an MTA bus depot. Next slide, please. The 100 feet tall Lincoln Tunnel ventilation structure is located to the south of the site. This portion of West 39th Street is mapped but unopened, and a 30-foot wide uh, southern half of West 39th Street is reserved for emergency access and maintenance. Next slide, please. The proposed map and text amendments to change to a C64 district and map the site within the special Hudson Yards district will facilitate development that's part of the continuous extension of the special district and C64 districts to the east. It's compatible with the area's high density, uh, transit oriented business and residential character. It will allow housing office, vehicle storage and large supermarket uses, which will meet the goals of the RFP and will maximize the affordable housing program by excluding police vehicle parking storage floor space from floor area, reducing the required setback from West 39th Street and allowing a total 24 FAR. The area would be mapped for MIH and developed under option two. However, all units will be subject to income restrictions for affordability. The site selection and acquisition actions will allow the building to include a permanent space for police vehicles to serve a nearby command center on West 42nd Street. Next slide, please. And John Butler will continue the presentation. 
Thank you very much, Lisa. And thank you to New York City Agencies, EDC, NYPD, and DCAS for making this project possible. My name is John Butler. I'm the Senior Vice President of Development for Radson Development, co-developer of this project. I'd like to now go over some of the programming elements that will be included in this project. Uh, first, there'll be a 14,000 square foot grocery store occupying the ground floor and cellar. Almost 39,000 square feet of replacement parking for NYPD, about 13,000 square feet of office space, a 680 key hotel tower, and a 350 unit affordable housing tower. Next slide, please. In this slide, we'd like to go over some of the key elements as well as the following slides of the programming. The South Tower will be predominantly contained by the hotel usage, with the base of the building occupying hotel usage as well, including conference rooms, uh, guest rooms, and amenity space. Again, the retail space will be confined to the grocery store and cellar, where a grocery store will serve the community and programs included in the program. Next slide, please. The North Tower is the taller of the towers. It'll rise 57 stories and include 274 units of affordable housing available through uh, available to families and individuals earning incomes between 90% and 165% of AMI, uh, as well as 75 supported units. There'll be amenity space located on the fifth floor, including um, the supportive housing offices, uh, as well as other residential amenities. Uh, the North Tower will also include um, other amenity space related to the affordable housing, and the um, NYPD parking will be confined within the base of the building, with office space wrapping around the base to have light and air windows that will better serve a connection to the community. Next slide, please. This is a breakdown of the affordability and uh, unit types uh, we plan to include. Uh, uh, 176 units will be serving um, in incomes between 155 and 165% of AMI. 98 units will serve incomes between 90% and 110% of AMI, with 75 units also serving uh, individuals and families of supportive housing. Of these units, 114 units will be designated as MIH. Again, the total affordable housing of all housing within the project will be 350 units. Next slide, please. So we'd like to pay mention uh, that the community board was essential partners throughout this process. Uh, earlier this year, when going to their vote, we received unanimous approval from the community board. They were an integral part in deciding the unit mix. Uh, as well as introducing supportive housing into this project. Um, as a condition for their support, we would continue working with them, as well as the Hell's Kitchen Hudson Yards Alliance, a bid in designing the public plaza that will be adjacent to this project. While this uh, plaza was not part of the, the ULIP action, it remains a very important part to the community, and we will continue working with them on the design of this plaza. Next slide, please. In addition to the programming and affordable housing that this project will create, we want to pay mention to the economic activity that will be also created by the project. About 15, 000, uh, 1,500 construction jobs will be created and almost 14, 400 permanent jobs. Uh, we will be committed to, uh, to a local hiring when once selecting our general contractor and selecting MWBE um, subcontractors where appropriate. We've also reached agreements with the Hotel Trades Council and 32BJ uh, to serve on this project. And with that, I'd like to hand the uh, proposal, um, the next part of the presentation over to Do Joe DiGenova uh, for the supportive housing portion of the project. Thank you, John. Next slide, please. Good morning. My name is Joe DiGenova and I'm the CEO of the Center for Urban Community Services. I'd like to start by saying thank you to the speak to speaker Johnson and to Community Board, Board 4 for insisting that supportive housing be included in this project. As you can see here from the, from the list of things that we do, we have a lot of experience 
helping people transition from being homeless to being housed. Um, we're considered one of the creators of the supportive housing model. We've been providing services and supportive housing since the early 80s, and we currently provide services in over 2,700 units of supportive housing. Next slide, please. Our service staff will be on site. This shows you what the design of the office space looks like. As John said, there'll be 75 units of supportive housing scattered throughout the building. We'll provide services on site and we'll provide the full complement of services and then some that are provided in, in supportive housing. We're very excited about this project. Um, as you all know, there's a real need for more supportive housing. I wanna thank you for your time and attention this morning. I'm gonna turn it over to Dan Kaplan. Good morning, Chair Moya and, and, and uh, council members. Uh, next slide, ne next two slides, please. Next slide, yes. Um, I'm Dan Kaplan, senior partner at FX Collaborative Architects. Um, I'll briefly discuss the, the design of, of this project. This is an elevation of the west side of Manhattan that uh, shows with Hudson Yards and Javits in the center and our, our project uh, on, uh, in yellow two towers, the residential tower at 680 feet and the, and the hotel tower at 653 feet. Next, next slide, please. Uh, so in crafting this project, um, we were very um, cognizant about bringing light and air to the residential units and came up with this idea of stepping uh, the two towers away from each other. So the uh, residential building steps from the west and the hotel steps from the east. Next slide, please. Here you, in the next slide, you could see uh, how the project looks from the various uh, vantage points. On the left is uh, from the east looking west with the two towers and the uh, hotel stepping away and the residential on the right. In the center is the residential tower from 11th Avenue and 40, 43rd Street looking south with, with its setbacks. And, and on the right side um, from Hudson River Park with the residential building stepping back and, and the hotel. Next. Uh, we gave the residential building pride of place at the corner of 40th and 11th Avenue and brought the residential scale down to the street in conversations with the community board with a strong residential corner entrance uh, to the right is the uh, NYPD uh, entrances and to the left in that gray box is the uh, grocery store entrance. Next slide, please. In contrast to the, to the residential, the hotel is more commercial and, fa and faces south. And you can see the various hotel entrances here. And on the left side, I will get into the design of, of that open space that Jonathan referenced uh, previously. Next slide, please. From a sustainability point of view, um, we are uh, meeting or exceeding the gold certification and a number of very uh, uh, energy efficient and, and habitat uh, related goals. Um, it's, I think the most important thing we're doing here is avoiding the all glass building and creating a substantially uh, opaque facade, which could be highly insulated. Next slide, please. Just on a, a ground uh, plan um, arrangement, the, on the right-hand side, I'll go clockwise on 40th Street, are the entrance to the NYPD garage is the loading dock. Uh, there's an office space entrance on 40th Street closer to the corner. As I said before, at the corner of 40th and 11th is a residential entrance, the supermarket mid-block on 11th Avenue, the, two, the, the three hotel entrances and the hotel entrance and access to the uh, 39th Street open space that is immediately to the left south of the of the uh, of the project. Next, on the on the setback roofs, um, there is there is green roofs uh, and outdoor space accessible to the residential tower on the setback with river views, and in the middle in the courtyard to the hotel with, with a green buffer between the hotel and the residential building. Next slide, please. And the next slide after that. As Jonathan mentioned, um, the public open space is very important to all. Um, it is not 
uh, part of, of this ULERP, but we wanted to show it to you. It will be reviewed by DOT subsequent to the ULERP. It's a, a 30 by 125 foot wide space. It's immediately within the 39th street, street bed extension. Um, the spaces around it, it, it is very constrained. There's that uh, bend structure to the Lincoln Tunnel. There's the Lincoln Tunnel below itself below the space and to the left is a Javits employee entrance. Nevertheless, we have uh, endeavored to make a, uh, a very green space here. Um, we, the, the other constraint I, I neglected to mention is that the um, everything will have to be removable and movable. So we've created this work with landscape architects, uh, 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 movable chairs and movable um, and removable planters that are of substantial size. Next slide, please. We'll wind up. So this is a, a view uh, from the east looking west. Uh, you can see the um, amount of greenery that we were able to achieve with these large movable planters and the open seating that is in coordination with the bid standards, uh, all accessing uh, the hotel and the uh, Javits uh, uh, employee entrance to, uh, to the left. And I think with that, um, that is the conclusion of our presentation. Next slide, please. And we look forward to any questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have uh, just uh, one quick question uh, for the panel. Uh, I understand that the um, West 39th Street pedestrian plaza improvements were subject to the review of the, uh, by the DOT um, after the conclusion of ULERP. Uh, how confident uh, are you that uh, what you're proposing for the space will be like uh, successfully built? Uh, yeah, I'll take that um, question. Um, that is correct. Um, the improvements to West 39th Street in the city street or would be subject to a DOT uh, application for revocable consent. Uh, we understand that that uh, petition is fairly straightforward and we believe that the design um, put forward in these conceptual drawings will be approved through that process. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let me check with uh, our council to see if there's any um, council members uh, who have any questions for this panel. Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay. Uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 495 uh, 11th Ave rezoning proposal? Yes, Chair, we have approximately two public speakers uh, who have signed up to speak. For those members of the public here to testify, please note again that witnesses will be called in panels. If you are a member of the public signed up to testify on this item, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the chair says that you may begin. Please also note that once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed from the meeting as a group and the next group of speakers will be announced. Once removed, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing at the council website. We will now hear from the first panel, which will include Enzo Ramirez and Gabby Gilmart. The first speaker will be Renzo Ramirez. Starting time. Uh, Renzo, hold on one second. Uh, just uh, as a reminder uh, for members of the public, you will be given two minutes to speak uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. Uh, Renzo, whenever you're ready, uh, you can begin. Starting time. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. 
My name is Renzo Ramirez and I am a member of 32BJ SEIU. As you know, 32BJ is the largest operating union representing 85,000 property service workers across the city. We represent workers who maintain, clean, and provide security services in buildings like the one being discussed at 495 11th Ave. Radson Development, which was selected by the New York City Economic Development Corporation to develop the site, is seeking a rezoning in order to build two towers, a 56-story commercial tower with a hotel and story residential tower. The rezoning would allow for the construction of 275 residential units. 100% of the residential units will be affordable. It will also allow for the construction of a community facility that will consist of 75 supportive housing units for formerly homeless individuals and families. We estimate that this development will create about four property service jobs. These jobs should help uplift working families and give workers dignity. The developers seeking this rezoning have reached out to 32BJ and have made a credible commitment to providing prevailing wage jobs to the future building service workers at this site. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. We know that this development will continue to uphold the industry standard and provide opportunities for working families to thrive. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The next speaker will be Gabby Gilmart. Starting time. Hi, good morning council members. Uh, my name is Gabby. I am the Deputy Political Director for the Hotel Trades Council, the Union for New York City's Hotel Workers, um, and I am here today to offer our support for this project. Um, the developers behind this project have approached this in a thoughtful and responsible manner by reaching out early in the process to key stakeholders, including the Hotel Trades Council. We're confident that this project will benefit new workers in New York by creating hundreds of good jobs, uh, good and high quality hotel jobs. We would like to encourage all of you to support the Slaughterhouse Project for this reason. Um, thank you for considering this proposal and uh, hearing my testimony today. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you for your testimony today. Council, do uh, we have any council members who have questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, there being uh, no questions for this panel, the witness panel uh, is excused. Uh, council, do we have any um, other members of the public who wish to testify? If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the 495 11th Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting chair will briefly stand at ease while we check for any uh, additional members of the public. Uh, Chair Moy, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify uh, on the 11th Avenue rezoning proposal. Uh, there being no other members of the public who wish to testify on uh, LU numbers 
855, and 856 for the uh, 495 11th Avenue rezoning proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. I now want to open the public hearing on LU number uh, numbers uh, 859, uh, 860 for the 270 Nordstrom Avenue rezoning proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment uh, in which relates to property in Council Member Carnegie's district in Brooklyn. I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. Uh, council, can you please call the uh, first panel for this item? Chair, the applicant panel for this item will include Stuart Beckerman, land use counsel for the applicant, Meredith Marshall, Mary Serafi, Andy Cohen, Zach Schwanbeck, and Shay Alster. Council, if you could please uh, administer that affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Mary Serafi. Zach Schwanbeck. Hi, Alistair. Andy Cohen. Meredith. Stuart Beckerman. And Meredith Marshall. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes, I do. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just as a reminder, we are in receipt of your uh, slideshow presentation and our staff will display it on screen whenever you are ready. Uh, slides will be advanced for you when you say next. Once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this uh, presentation may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now uh, if the panelists would uh, please uh, restate your names and organizations for the record, uh, you may begin. Uh, hi, uh, this is Stuart Beckerman. I'm from the uh, law office of Slater and Becker, uh, I'm sorry, Hirsch and Singer and Epstein. I'm a partner at Hirsch and Singer and Epstein. Um, and the first speaker will be Meredith Marshall, who is co-founder and managing partner of ERP companies. And we'll start with the first slide. Thank you. Uh, that'll be the next slide. Um, yes, just to give a, a bit of context, I think will be helpful here. Uh, again, I'm Meredith Marshall. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present um, before the council. I'm managing partner and co-founder of BRP Companies. We're a fully integrated real estate investment development firm based in New York City. We were founded in 2003. And after my wife kicked me out of my uh, apartment, we, um, uh, for our business out of the apartment, we had a storefront on 739 Fulton Street, not too far away from um, our developments in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Um, we're a vertically integrated firm. We have a development firm. Uh, we have a construction outfit. We have a property management group and we have a, an equity fund targeting a transit oriented workforce and affordable housing throughout the four, uh, uh, five boroughs. We, we've built about 2.5 million square feet of mixed income developments. And we're proud to say that we're the largest MWBE development firm in the state of New York probably in the tri-state area and probably one of uh, top one, two or three, uh, th uh, three firms in the um, country doing um, like work. Um, we're an award-winning group um, in Bedford-Stuyvesant and Central Brooklyn, including East New York and um, Fort Greene. We own about 1300 units, about 85% are um, uh, serves the low-income population and a, a very low income population, including uh, supportive housing developments. Um, we're, we're showing developments here on in Bedford-Stuyvesant that we've completed, starting with the Garvey in 2009, 100% affordable between um, targeting incomes between 40 and 
Then we moved on to the Bradford 2011, again, financed by HBD and HDC, 105 units, 100% affordable targeting incomes from 30% up to 130% of AMI. And then we have 20 projects mm -hmm. owing to the former um, 421A, which are 20% below 80% of AMI and the balanced market rate developments. The first two developments were heavily subsidized by the city and include city owned land. The, the subsequent two projects were um, on private sites, no city subsidy, but still 20% affordable to uh, area residents making uh, at or below 80% of AMI. Next slide, please. What we found in our developments, uh, we build, we are a large affordable developer and we have now some of the largest developments in the city outside of Bedford-Stuyvesant, like the Bronx, uh, with La Central, uh, we have the National Urban League site in Harlem. And what we found is, um, you know, the um, affordable um, developments target AMIs that have a strict uh, regulatory uh, constraints. And what we need in certain markets, particularly bed and, and we did this in concert with um, Councilman Carnegie, is, is to build naturally occurring uh, affordable housing on the market rate side, and then target a low income population on, on, on the inclusionary side. And that's what we attempted to do. And quite frankly, we proposed an R, an R8A development, which will give us a bulk of 7.2, um, about 477 units, and when we went to the community board and the borough president, we didn't get the support we thought we'd get, although it was close for the community board. I think we had a 60-40 split um, against uh, the, the R8A. We went back to the drawing board. We heard the community. We, we went to Department of City Planning headed by our good friend Winston Von Engel, and we came up with a compromise uh, R7D, R7X, which would um, generate 380 unit development uh, targeting the essential workers, healthcare workers, education workers, uh, workers that are uh, have been hit for left out of the affordable housing developments that we built, but can't afford, you know, market rate um, 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 brownstone uh, acquisition. Uh, we have 114 units, 30% uh, um, uh, using MIH option four. Um, we have 30 about 30,000 square foot of retail, of which um, 5,000 uh, square feet would be targeted to community use. We want to work with, uh, we've targeted a minority manager, a uh, minority firm that's a manager of, uh, of these uh, developments that we've worked with in the past and some of our developments. And what they would do is they would target small users from 1,000 square feet, maybe 1,500 feet, uh, and, and they would lease the units at below market rates to those um, community residents. Again, uh, we're seeking a rezoning uh, for R7X to R7D. Uh, it'll be mapped to MIH. So we have some permanently af affordable housing and we seek your support. Um, now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mary Serafi to get into the details. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Next slide, please. On this slide, I just want to represent um, the different scenarios of zoning. The current zoning is an R7A. And um, one thing I'd really like to highlight on this is that the current inclusionary is voluntary. So someone could potentially build the site with no um, inclusionary, no affordability at all. Our original proposed R8A with a C2-4 overlay, um, um, as Meredith mentioned, yielded 487 units and changing it from voluntary inclusionary to mandatory inclusionary with 144 um, units. Our, uh, our revised approved um, city planning district is an R7X slash R7D, also with the C2-4 overlay um, yielding 380 units and 114 of those will be mandatory inclusionary. I, I'll pass this to Stuart Beckerman right now and I'll come back in a few slides. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, first of all, good morning, uh, Chair Moya and council members. Um, thank you for, uh, for hearing us. 
So this uh, slide shows one of the rationales for this uh, proposal. You know, it, it, it really does support uh, the increased density, but also the commercial overlay. Uh, we have excellent access to transit. Uh, we're on the corner of, uh, of Nostrand and DeKalb. Uh, it's at the end. And uh, it's uh, the G train subway station is one block away. Uh, and in, directly in front of our site is uh, the B40 is a stop for the B44 select bus service, which provides transit to other subway lines. Uh, both Nostrand and, uh, and DeKalb are major commercial corridors. On the opposite side of DeKalb is a, a home, is a super block with a Home Depot. And uh, on the opposite side of Nostrand is a large medical facility. Um, and as this slide shows, uh, we are the only block front out of the six block fronts around us, including ours, that does not allow commercial use. Uh, you've got uh, four of the, four of the uh, block fronts have commercial overlays, and the fifth is in the M15, which also allows uh, a commercial use, which is, of course, uh, exemplified by the Home Depot. Um, and uh, so mapping the C24 will fill in the gap that currently exists in the zoning in regard to the commercial overlays. Next slide, please. So uh, this aerial shows the, uh, the context in which our site sits. And as, and as you can see, there are several uh, buildings of comparable size nearby. Uh, on our block down the street is 13 Spencer Court, which is 31 Kosciuszko Street. It's 12 stories, it's 135 feet tall. Uh, it was constructed prior to the Bed Stuy North rezoning in 2012. Um, and less than a quarter of a mile away is the NYCHA uh, development, Lafayette Gardens, where buildings are uh, as high as 20 stories. Um, and uh, to the north, uh, in, the, uh, in the, the lavender, I guess it is, in light purple, uh, there is a large swath of M zone land which extends to the waterfront uh, and the Brooklyn Navy Yard and also to Dumbo and Williamsburg. Um, and that encompasses the superblock to the north, which has the Home Depot and also PS54. Um, so, this commercial and institutional context surrounding site actually reflects this area's history as an urban renewal area. Uh, the site is one of the very few large scale sites in the neighborhood available for redevelopment. Uh, and it represents, in our view, a buffer between the commercial manufacturing area to the north and the residential area uh, that surrounds us. Um, so uh, on that note, um, I will turn, over, turn uh, the microphone over to Mary Serafi. And next slide, please. Thanks, Stuart. The next two slides are representing massings. Um, again, comparing our original proposed R8A and um, our approved R7X, R7 D zoning. Um, I know it's coming up soon. Next slide. Great, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we had a lot of meetings with the community board and we worked closely with city planning, um, listening to the concerns of mostly bulk and um, height issues in particular on Kosciuszko Street. Uh, our original scheme had 14 stories along Nostrand and Decalb, um, the heavily transit oriented streets with 12 stories on Kosciuszko, which is more townhome row. Our, our revised proposal is now reducing um, the height on Kosciuszko to nine stories and 13 stories along DeKalb and Nostrand Avenue. What it also does, it lets us break up the street wall, which we'll see in a few minutes with the rendering. I could talk more then. Um, we did maintain the commercial, just to understand the commercial overlay is, a, is along DeKalb Avenue 100 feet back, along Nostrand Avenue 100 feet back, and there is a section of Kosciuszko that has no commercial overlay. The next slide. Is, is, really, is a view from the Kosciuszko side to just represent um, our, our careful consideration of the town home row. Um, and then next slide. 
Um, these are renderings of the two scenarios. Um, to emphasize GF55's vision, you'll see um, the base of the building is somewhat of a townhome-like um, street emphasis, and we try to maximize the light and air on the upper floors um, as a combination of both context contextual design and um, making it as light as possible on the floors above. Um, this, will, this represents the commercial spaces um, predominantly on DeKalb Avenue across from, as Stuart mentioned, the, the Home Depot site, um, and as well as on Nordstrand Avenue. To talk a little bit about the project overall, um, you know, the project will be highly amenitized to all residents. Sustainability in our, in BRPs preview has always been um, very important and is encouraged and, you know, we maximize the sustainability um, for all our properties. And I think that the next slide will break out more of the commercial space. Um, the building, um, as mentioned by Meredith, will contain 5,000 square feet for local tenants in the community along, we've highlighted those spaces along Decalb as well as on the corner of Casfiasco and Nostrand Avenue. Um, we have the big box commercial user right at the corner, um, providing the parking for zoning as required, as well as bike storage as required. Um, and we don't have the amenity plan, but the amenities are both provided on lower and the highest level so that, as mentioned, all tenants have um, access to views from the higher floors and you know, all the amenities being provided. I think um, on that note, it's the end of our presentation. I just wanna thank, thank you for this opportunity to present to the group. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just a, a couple of questions here. Um, the, the application was modified at city planning to reduce the density from the proposed uh, R8A to a mixed uh, R7D and uh, uh, R7X. Have you heard any input from the community board or the borough president on this modification? We haven't heard uh, directly uh, from them. We know that there um, we had some. Um, we didn't have support for the R uh, the R eight A seven point two FAR, and in fact, when we had early conversations, the community board wanted us to consider the seven D and the seven X. So we assume that um, we have we have some support. Again, for the R eight A, we had about a forty percent vote. At, uh, at the community board for the support of the seven seven point two FAR. Okay. Um, and this uh, application proposes using the MIH workforce option uh, at thirty percent of the floor area at an average of uh, one hundred fifteen uh, AMI. Yes. Uh, units priced at the upper end of this uh, affordability range appear to actually be at or above uh, current market rate prices in the area. What is the rationale for uh, the uh, supporting the, the workforce option here? And have you considered uh, the MIH option too? We did, we had a, a greater affordability, but it only works in this instance. This is not a public site, we built on public site. And again, we are one of the largest affordable developers in, in the city and it just doesn't work um, without the, the, the greater bulk. So there's a trade-off. If we have the 7.2, we can provide greater affordability. A smaller building, we have to use the option where we blend at 115% of AMI to make that work. That being said, we kind of disagree with the 130 being um, above market. We have market rate uh, projects, uh, you know, you know, buildings not too far away, and the market is above the 130% of AMI, uh, particularly with the um, one bedroom units and the smaller units. The market has moved in Bedford Stuyvesant. Got it. And have you made a commitment to, to good paying and quality jobs uh, on this site? Uh, we, we, we have a history of working with 32BJ uh, on all of our sites that have uh, Affordable New York or 421A. And in fact, one development in uh, Councilman Salamanca's um, 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 
district with this 100% affordable housing, we still have 32BJ as our um, as our partner on, uh, on that right, site. So project. This project, we will. Um, uh, we we haven't uh, uh, concluded that with 32BJ only because we don't own the site. We are contract vendee, and if we don't get the zoning, um, we don't know what the current developer would do. So that's the only, I mean, quite frankly, and, and I spoke to Carl Bragg's team about that. If, if this moves forward at this level, we would have a deal with uh, 32BJ. Okay. Um, my last question is the uh, proposed development includes uh, 176 on-site parking spaces, uh, more than required by zoning uh, at a time when many developers with applications before us are seeking to waive parking entirely. Uh, what is your rationale behind including such a large number of parking spaces? Well, again, uh, we own, I don't know, uh, seven, eight parking garages, and uh, we have three in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Parking is at a premium now owing to COVID. Um, a lot of folks are, are driving now. And in fact, we were um, fortunate enough to secure um, a, a great brand of, for, for the grocery store, and they will have about 20,000 square feet, and we will need the parking. We'll need transient parking during the day. And we believe we will need um, additional parking uh, for the residents, for the permanent residents of the building going forward. So three years ago, we were reducing parking uh, uh, post COVID. We we, 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 we were re-looking, um, uh, uh, well, uh, our entire approach to parking, quite frankly. So um, we think 176 um, attended parking spaces will, will be uh, adequate for the development given our, our proposed uses. Okay. Okay, that's it uh, for me. Uh, is there uh, any other council members that may have questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay. Uh, there being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 270 uh, Nordstrom Avenue rezoning application? For any members of the public who do wish to testify on the 270 Nordstrom Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now uh, and chair the meeting will briefly extend it as well. We check for any additional members of the public. Chairman, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on uh, LU's number numbers uh, 859 and 860 for the uh, 270 uh, Nordstrom Avenue rezoning proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the items uh, are laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU uh, numbers 857 and 858 for the uh, 252 Victory Boulevard rezoning proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment, and which relates to property in council member Rose's district in Staten Island. Once again, for uh, anyone wishing, uh, watching online uh, who wishes to testify on this item, if you have not already done so, uh, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting uh, the council's website. Uh, council, if you, oh, I'm sorry. I would like to, to acknowledge that we have uh, our council member, council member Rose uh, here with us today. And thank you, council member Rose for your patience today. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to you for uh, some remarks. Thank you so much, Chair Moya. Um, and I want to say happy birthday to Councilmember Ayala. Um, I, I just have uh, very uh, limited remarks about uh, the Victory Boulevard um, project. Um, I just want to say that after working closely with the applicant team for 252 Victory Boulevard rezoning, they have uh, incorporated several of my suggestions to make this project an asset to our community. Um, it was an example of what uh, working collaboratively um, 
at its best. It really was um, an example of how these projects can move along um, and uh, wind up with a project that everyone is satisfied with. So I look forward to hearing from the applicant team and any members from the public who wish to testify today. Thank you, Chair. Um, you. And I have remarks for North River, but I'll wait till that's called. Okay, thank you, council member. Uh, council, if you can please call up the first panel uh, for this item. The, the applicant panel uh, for this item includes Eric Palatnik, land use council for the applicant, and Alex Harrow, uh, project architect. Council, if you could please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hand, state your name for the record. Alex Harrow. Eric Palatnik. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. I do. Okay, thank you. Uh, just as a reminder, when you're ready to go through your slideshow, please say so. It will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and now if the panelists would uh, please restate your names and organizations for the record, you may begin. Hello, my name is Eric Palatnik. I'm an attorney representing the owner of 252 Victory Boulevard. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Alex will introduce himself after. Uh, I'll commence with the, the uh, application. As you can see, this is the proposed building in front of you. It's a handsomely designed building that, as the councilwoman just said, has been very, very uh, much a collaborative effort between us, the community board, and the borough president's office. It's resulted in a proposed rezoning of the property from an R32 uh, to an R6B with the commercial overlay. Next slide, please. Uh, if the rezoning were to be approved, as the next slide will be describing, it would allow for a five-story building that would have approximately 34 dwelling units, 12 of which would be affordable at an average of 60% AMI. Next slide, please. The next slide will show you the location of the property, which is located on Victory Boulevard. Next slide, please. I apologize. Location of the property, which is located on Victory Boulevard. You can see diagonally across the street is a large structure that's known as the Jersey Street Garage. Some of you may have become familiar with it. It is the subject right now, I believe, of an RFP uh, to redevelop it for residential. The site is vacant and it rests within a hillside preservation district. Uh, the proposed action is asking to build within the hillside preservation district and uh, it will leave a 30% slope, which is allowable and satisfactory within the district. Next slide, please. The next few pictures are gonna show you, show you what the property actually looks like. Uh, as you'll see in the pictures that are about to be displayed, it's nothing uh, dramatic other than a hillside. I could please show the next few slides. Next slides. And you can just keep clicking through the pictures so that people can get a flavor for what it looks like. As I said a moment ago, it's a hillside. Uh, the building, you could stop when you get to uh, out of the pictures, please. The building will be built into the hillside so that the people from the top uh, that live above it will not be obstructed in their views. Next slide, please. This slide shows you the proposed zoning district on the right, on the left is what exists right now in the middle of the page with, it's a very busy page. You can see the extension of the commercial overlay and there will be an R6B district. And next slide, please. This shows you further the continuation. Now, if you can click to the plans, please. And I will let Alex Harrow describe the plans, Alex. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Alex Harrow, Friar Collaborative Architects. Can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, Eric, we're not in the plans yet. You want to cover any of this yeah. stuff? Put the next few slides, please, so you get to the plans. Next. <clears throat> next slide. Keep going. Next. <laughs> There, up, uh, one more. There you go. Uh, so this is just starting, um, this is just starting to show it. This is just a diagrammatic 
uh, rendering here, but it shows on the left hand side we are in the um, um, <clears throat> hillsides, special hillsides preservation district, and we are on a pretty steep slope. Uh, part of our area does have steep slope. And you can see on the lower left-hand corner, if you look at the site map on the left-hand side, uh, the lower left-hand corner is 128 feet, upper right-hand corner is 200 feet. So we are close to uh, 72, actually it's almost a 75 foot incline from one corner of the site to the other. Next, next slide, please. There we go, okay. This is a rendering uh, showing what the project is proposed to look like at the moment. We have a number of things in here um, that are unique to the site. First one is, <clears throat> you can see it's a five story, it's a, it's a six story building, it's five stories plus a lower level of parking, which is on the lower level um, on, and sort of in the middle to the left hand side of the, of the drawing. Uh, you see a car down there, that's the lowest level, that is one level completely filled with parking. Um, because we're on such a steep, portion of Victory Boulevard, you can see as you go up the slope a little bit up the sidewalk, you'll see another car entering the property. At the next level, we have another um, parking area within the building as well. Um, you can also see here, um, we are a few stories. We're actually, it's really technically actually only two stories um, at the front, which is the lower, uh, the lower portion of the, re of the uh, rendering. And then we have three more residential floors that step back as the site actually steps back. We're trying to incorporate a lot of green space uh, on the roof of the building and green, um, green roof within the building terraces as well. We're also breaking up the facade. Um, it, it doesn't quite show it as clearly here, but we are trying to break up the facade so that it doesn't appear as monolithic as you move up the street. Next slide, please. That's just a... a a view of the entry of the building showing that we will also have a daycare and a small commercial component. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we want to show a couple of things. Number one, cellar level. We have parking. We have uh, 31 parking spaces down in the cellar, 28 at the upper, at the upper level over there, which will be at the same level as the daycare, commercial area, and residential lobby. Uh, residential lobby shown in yellow, which will be able to enter the building um, they can go in a covered area back to the front where they will not have to be exposed to the weather. Next slide, please. Okay, this one shows the daycare. Daycare is 7,500 square feet. We also have dedicated uh, some parking for daycare to come in. This is an important point. Daycare is accessed um, from the sidewalk as well as a uh, a separate entrance to the daycare from within the parking, from the upper parking garage, which you can see on the lower, <clears throat> the left-hand corner, um, the two dots or the blue dots show where the entry is accessible for the daycare. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. This shows the commercial component, which um, would enter solely from the sidewalk area. Next slide. And then we're just showing floor plans uh, with the number of units that we have. You can see 46 total residential units, 12 of them are affordable. Next slide, please. Uh, next. Uh, one more, please. I think is this the last. Is this our last slide? Yeah, here we go. Um, and then on the right hand side of this, the roof, it shows the setbacks. Um, because it is such a steep slope, as I mentioned before, we're, we were very conscious of trying to not build something that's going to have too large a presence from the sidewalk as, uh, as you're walking or driving. We wanted something that was going to work within the slope. Uh, in addition to working with the slope, um, we have a, a height limitation on the property. We've pulled the building farther forward, which also allows us to keep the top of the building below the site level from the single family houses that are above us on, uh, on Avon and Rose, the streets that are, that are behind the building, which are not even seen from this. Uh, so their, their views out their windows will not be obstructed by our building. It's an important point we were trying to maintain. 
Um, plus, you can see up here we are trying to incorporate solar panels as well as green roof um, recreation area for the residents. We have uh, a lot of terrace space of which we plan to build some of this out as uh, green roof uh, and plant it as well. Uh, next slide. Um, then the only other things that we have, these are, these are some of the points that I made earlier. Um, building is located closer to the Victory Boulevard side, uh, precisely for the reason to keep it, keep visibility open for the residents who are above us. Um, we're going to facet the facade, um, setbacks to green roofs. Um, other than that, the only other things I can tell you, we have uh, stormwater retention. Um, we will be uh, utilizing Energy Star appliances, high efficiency, high efficacy LED lighting, um, insulating glass, um, higher levels of insulation. Uh, the 2020 um, energy code is actually quite, uh, it's actually really terrific and very strong. So this, this will um, be incorporated into every aspect of the building. Next slide, please. Uh, Eric, I think this is back. Yeah, to you. I think we, this is a good time to, to conclude. Uh, this just provides the affordability paradigm that we spoke about earlier, where 20 to 26 percent of the floor area uh, will be provided uh, as MIH uh, option level two and a, a level of 60 percent. Excuse me, level option one. Uh, one, one. Can I make one last comment? Uh, I think there are yeah, I apologize. I just need to correct what I said. The streets at the top of a, a, a just above us are Rosewood and Bayview. Apologies. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Uh, well, you answered my question there, uh, Eric, just now. So um, I have no further questions. I want to uh, turn it over to Council Member Rose if she has any questions or any one of my other colleagues. Uh, thank you again, Chair. Um, I, I don't have any um, questions. And uh, I don't have any questions because, uh, like I stated, um, we work very closely um, with the team uh, and they incorporated all of the aspects that um, we felt were important to making this project not only a, a good green project, but um, one that uh, would be an asset to the community one that would meet um, a community need um, by providing uh, daycare uh, spaces for daycare and um, and uh, the public amenities. Uh, parking was a very important issue and um, they provided off the street um, parking. Um, so basically they did everything that we requested. And uh, so uh, I'm in support of this project. Great, uh, thank, thank you, you. Councilmember Rose. Uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 252 Victory Boulevard rezoning application? If there are any members of the public who yet wish to testify on the 252 Victory Boulevard rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. Chair the meeting will briefly stand at ease while we just confirm there are no additional members. Chair, Chair, it does appear that we, I believe we have one speaker uh, for this item. The uh, speaker panel uh, will include one speaker, Sean Strafford. Sean Strafford will be uh, testifying on this item. Okay. Starting time. Sean, whenever you're ready. Um, I think this is supposed to be for the I'm which sorry. item are you testifying for, Sean? North River? Not yet. Okay. 
Pray to get to that <laughs> <Okay>. one. <next. laughs> You're early. <laughs> yeah. All right, Sean, thank you. And uh, with that, Chair, we, uh, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU numbers uh, 857, 858 for the 252 Victory Boulevard rezoning proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. I now open the public hearing on LU's number uh, 842, 843, 844 for the River North rezoning proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment, zoning text amendment, and zoning special permit, all uh, of which are related to property in Council Member Rose's district in Staten Island. Uh, and as a reminder, at, uh, and I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. Uh, I now want to uh, recognize council member Rose um, for some uh, opening remarks. Thank you again, um, Chair Moya. Um, today, uh, again, we have an application before us that has been um, rejected by our local community. The residents are concerned that the proposed density is unprecedented and will be used by future applicants or city agencies to approve similar density across the North Shore. I'm so sorry, someone's ringing my doorbell. Um, <laughs> it's okay, sorry. council member, uh, we'll okay. give you time. Don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go answer it or how will it, I'll let them wait. Um, so uh, I, I look really, um, so this proposed density is unprecedented and will be used by future applicants or city agencies to approve similar dis density across the North Shore. So we're looking forward to the applicant's response to this concern. Also share my constituents' concerns about the height of the proposed buildings. My previous remarks that were submitted to the Department of City Planning reflect as much. I cannot support this application with the proposed allowable building heights. I certainly have concerns about the proposed affordability on this site also. The additional density requested for this site calls for, um, for the additional density requested on this site calls for additional affordable housing above and beyond the requirements of MIH. I cannot support this proposal with the current level of affordability on this site. I look forward to hearing what kind of commercial uses will be provided on site. The St. George community would benefit from the inclusion of a grocery store and community oriented uses such as daycare programming. I cannot support this project without additional community benefits for our local residents. I look forward to hearing more from the applicant and the feedback from the community. Uh, thank you again, Chair Moya. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Rose, uh, for your opening statement. Um, with that, uh, Council, if you can please call up the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Zach Caden, on behalf of the developer, Minakshi Srinivasan, uh, Land Use and Zoning Advisor, Dan Kaplan, Ben Abelman, Project Architects, and Tony Finger, Land Use Counsel for the applicant. Uh, thank you, Council. If you can please administer the affirmation. Panelists, if you would please raise your right hands and state your name for the record. Dan Kaplan, Ben Abelman, Zach Caden, Nelchi Shinabasan, Tony Finger. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes, I do. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, as a reminder, we have your slideshow presentation, and uh, whenever you're ready to go through it, please say so. Uh, and our staff will display it on the screen. Once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now <laughs> if the panelists would uh, please restate your names and organizations for the record. Uh, you may begin uh, with the presentation. Okay. Zach Caden, Madison Realty Capital. Sean 
Should we ready to start? Perfect. Good afternoon, Chair Moya, Council Member Rhodes, and members of the Zoning Subcommittee. I am Zach Caden, Director of Development at Madison Realty Capital, who is the applicant for the River North proposal. We are very excited to present the River North project to you today. Next slide, please. To orient everyone, here's a quick aerial view of the St. George area. You can see the project site highlighted or outlined in orange, as well as as well as its proximity to Staten Island's public transportation, the Staten Island Ferry, the New York City Ferry, the railway, and local bus stops. The River North project will complement and enhance ongoing land use projects and activities that have supported and strengthened the North Shore community of Staten Island. Next slide, please. Madison is committed to seeing this project through to completion and over the last several years assembled and engaged a stellar team, including FX Collaborative, the architects, Star White House, landscape architects, and Langan, the environmental consultants to make this project happen. Next slide, please. Madison has an excellent and consistent record in developing mixed use residential buildings with affordable housing, as well as economic development projects in many parts of the city. Our professionalism to oversee and advance projects through a robust public process and to construct, complete and contribute to neighborhoods is a testament to our vision and commitment to implement River North that will deliver substantial benefits to the community. You can see here in the top right is a project in Woodside that we actually broke ground in in February, finished uh, foundation, and we're excited to bring a public school, a K through five, 476 student public school, as well as 478 affordable units to Woodside, Queens. Next slide, please. the slide switch. Madison is also no stranger to Staten Island, where we have completed several projects on the North Shore, including downtown plaza, aka 364 Bay Street on the left, which we've completed construction and leased up. It's the Crunch Fitness is a tenant there, which many of you may know as well as the view 224 Richmond Terrace, which is the center image, which is only a few lots over from our site. We finished the construction there, leased it and sold it, which is, as I said, adjacent to River North. And now on the right-hand side is very important. This is an image, which is just an example of Madison. We invest um, and we believe to be boots on the ground in the community as we develop in. So during COVID, we knew Richmond University Medical Center was hit particularly hard by the pandemic. We partnered with the frontline food trucks, which is that image in the background, just to give essential workers their free food, coffee, and put a smile on their face during the heights of the pandemic. Next slide, please. River North will be a transit-oriented mixed-use development, which will include three residential buildings with 750 units, of which 225 will be set aside under MIH option two. The ground floor will be activated by local retail, hopefully community oriented, community oriented retail, as the council member mentioned earlier, and create an enhanced pedestrian environment with street trees that will improve connectivity. There will be new public open spaces on site, passive and active, as well as new parking capacity. Also, we have an agreement already with 32BJ for building services, and we are working closely with building skills and youth build impact to provide local uh, opportunities for members in the community. Next slide, please. Here's a quick overview. We actually engaged CARP Strategies, an urban planning consultant, to analyze the economic impact during the construction and uh, operating phase of the project. So quickly to run through the bullets, you'll see under construction phase, we assume about 590 jobs per year, 
per year with 880 jobs at peak employment, produce over 450 million in economic output that will circulate throughout the Staten Island economy, economy result in over 22 million estimated in 2024 tax, total tax revenue, including city and state taxes. That's during construction. Moving on to once the buildings are completed and put into operation, um, total annual economic output in the first year of operations, 52.8 million. 4.8 million in total tax revenue in the first year of operation, and then also 48 permanent jobs, but there could be as many as 200 new community-wide jobs as a result of this project. Next slide, please. Bringing new affordable housing to this neighborhood is one of our primary goals. We are proposing 30% of the floor area or option two under MIH, which we figure would be about approximately 225 units. Uh, would cover three income bands. And here you see the breakdown that we're proposing between the 60% AMI band, the 80% AMI band, and the 110% AMI band. And also you can see that we've uh, weighted the distribution to the slightly lower end, which is about the 60% AMI, AMI tranche. Next slide, please. Just to give you an idea of how the AMI translate to family types, we thought it would be helpful, this visual. For example, a household of four with single income, healthcare worker earning 45 dollars to $50,000 would qualify around 40% AMI. While dual income families, family of four earning together 80,000 would be around 60% AMI. A single MTA worker earning 65,000 would be at 80% AMI and dual in income police officer and teacher with a child earning about 100,000 would be at 100% AMI. With that, I'll turn it over, turn over the presentation to Ben Abelman and Dan, Dan Kaplan at FX Collaborative, the architects for the project. Thank you. Next slide, please. And good, uh, I guess, afternoon now um, to, the, to the council members and uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present this project. Um, as Zach mentioned, the site is located adjacent to the civic infrastructure of downtown St. George and is within a 10 minute walking radius of the St. George Ferry Terminal in the largest transit hub in Staten Island. What's important in this image is uh, the two overlaid colors that you see. The pink color to the right of the image is the special St. George district. In the green color is the Hill special hillsides preservation district, which the site is currently zoned. As you can see, the site sits at the abutment of these two special districts and is in fact at the base of the hill um, fronting onto Richmond Terrace and Stuyvesant Place, two vital corridors of the St. George area. Next slide, please. Hillside's Preservation District is mapped throughout Staten Island, largely within low density, single family uh, residential zoning districts. The R6 District, which the River North Project sits, mapped within the Special Hillside's Preservation District, is an anomaly within this district. In the controls crafted, within the special district are very responsive to the conditions to which you see on the, on the screen here. Next slide, please. Unless the conditions that you see on our site. This image shows the uh, adjacencies of the two special districts. Again, green is the Hillsides Preservation District. Purple is the special St. George District. And we can see that the site sits at the low end of the hillside, fronting on Stuyvesant Place and Richmond Terrace on a block, which, is comp which its natural topography has already been compromised by the existing presence of the Castleton Park apartment complex in its parking structure, which is built onto the site. Next slide, please. As of right, development would be governed by the Special Hillsides Preservation District in the R6 district that the site is currently mapped. The Hillsides Preservation District limits the location of build, building footprints to locations which are not in steep slope areas. As you can see on site B with the saturated blue color, that is the only uh, uh, feasible building footprint site on, on the two uh, lots that make up the River North property today. 
And in the end, the site, if, we're to, if to be developed as of right, would only be able to achieve less than 50% of its um, entitled floor area because of the limitations of the underlying zoning. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, thank you. Um, and so our, no, back one, sorry. Our, our approach to the project is to merge the um, ideals embedded within these two special districts. From the Hillsides Preservation District, our intent is to leave as much of the site unbuilt as possible, preserving 50% of open space on the site. In terms of the St. George District, we look to its uh, bulk language where it requires uh, street walls in, in building bases with active ground floor uses with building forms uh, uh, and towers above, which are perpendicular to the waterfront to provide view corridors through the site. So now uh, Dan Kaplan will walk you through these strategies and, and discuss how this plays out in the design. Uh, next slide, please. Dan Kaplan, Senior Partner, FX Collaborative. So from site planning principles and open space, uh, really two headlines. Number one is instead of a continuous wall of buildings, we have subdivided the site into three buildings, which also provides three open spaces, uh, three bands of greenery that we call green fingers that come down from the hillside onto Richmond Terrace. Uh, second is, well, well the, those green corridors um, provide um, habitat preservation, stormwater retention, which uh, recent events have made uh, even more critical and um, basically allows for open space and view corridors, which is the second principle. Uh, by setting the building the, on your right significantly lower and creating gaps between the, build, the two building, the, the three buildings, we've uh, allowed views from the upland, including the Castleton Park apartment buildings, uh, to the rear of your screen and on the left, um, Hamilton Avenue, and I'll show you that in a moment. Next slide, please. Which is a plan of the, of the site plan showing the three buildings and basically the three open spaces. Uh, in, in conversations with the council member, we have um, included two publicly accessible open spaces one, a passive open space at the corner of Hamilton Avenue and Stuyvesant Place, uh, and another one uh, between building two and building three, which is active open space. Next slide, please. This shows an image of the new uh, passive open space at the corner of, of Hamilton Avenue and Stuyvesant Place, and actually is a as an end cap to uh, Stuyvesant Place in, in St. George. Uh, it is well appointed it, uh, with, with green spaces, with seating um, uh, and paving. Uh, it is nestled by the building and then wraps up uh, Hamilton Avenue. And also you can see here the effect of setting back the buildings from Hamilton Avenue, allowing for uh, the upland uh, uphill uh, uh, single family houses to have an uninterrupted view down, down the hill. Next slide, please. This shows the new, uh, the proposed uh, uh, active open space that's accessed off uh, Stuyvesant Place with a gracious opening uh, to, uh, to the sidewalk, uh, to the reconstructed sidewalk, I should say, two new um, in purple um, equipment areas, a recreational lawn uh, in the center and seating uh, uh, at the end of the page. Next slide. Architecturally and massing wise, uh, we've created strong contextual basis uh, with active uses, screen parking, uh, and uh, strong texture uh, and architecture uh, for the uh, upper building massing. It's well tailored with multiple step backs and setbacks uh, uh, pulling away from uh, the surrounding context. Next slide, please. 
over the um, evolution of the project uh, and work, uh, working in dialogue with um, various stakeholders, we have significantly modified the massing and reduced the height, most significantly on the building uh, to the right, which is building three, which was reduced eight stories to uh, open up views from the Castleton Park uh, apartment house. In addition, the two, uh, the, the two taller buildings were reduced by, by uh, approximately 30 feet. Next slide, please. We uh, architecturally, we have sought to um, anchor the building into the St. George context by looking carefully at the architecture and material palette and avoided the all glass uh, paradigm uh, of, that you see in a lot of new buildings. Next slide, please. Here is a view that shows those uh, bases and the architectural treatment. Uh, this is looking uh, down uh, Stuyvesant Place showing uh, the two new, two new buildings and the green uh, uh, spaces coming through. Next slide, please. Go ahead. Uh, this aerial shows uh, the, how the three buildings step. Uh, they're uh, a family together working together. Not, they do not all match, but they, are, they, have, they share the same DNA with the, with the lower building in the foreground opening up views from Castleton Park Apartments. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, a skyline view uh, between the um, uh, careful massing, uh, the se selections of materials, the opening up of the uh, buildings and subdividing them into three parts and the green uh, fingers coming down from the hillside we have created a, uh, a ensemble of buildings that complements the skyline of St. George. And with that, I'll turn it over to Menakshi who will discuss the zoning actions. Thank you. Thank you, next slide please. Good afternoon, Chair Moya, Council Member Ambrose and members of the zoning subcommittee. I'm Inakshi Srinivasan, Senior Land Use and Zoning Advisor at Frame 11, representing uh, the applicant. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to present today. The project requires three zoning actions. The first is a zoning map amendment to change the R6 C22 overlay district, uh, which is a medium density district within the Special Hillsides Preservation District that's mapped currently along Richmond Terrace and Stuyvesant Place to an R73 uh, C24 district overlay, uh, which is also a medium density district within the special St. George district. The second action is a zoning text amendment to the special St. George district to incorporate the R73 zoning, which basically would parallel uh, the underlying R73 regulations. The text amendment would also create a new special permit to waive bulk regulations in order to support a superior site plan and other design. And finally, the text amendment would also extend the mandatory inclusionary housing uh, designation to the rezoning area. The third action is a special permit pursuant to the proposed text to waive bulk regulations to allow our proposed project and the carefully crafted site plan and architectural design. The next uh, slide, please. So just to recap, uh, the River North project and the zoning package are based on sound planning principles and will harness time-tested tools to achieve quality development for Staten Island's North Shore. Revamping the site out of the Special Hill Sites Preservation District responds to an existing altered and degraded condition of the site's natural topography and its isolation from the remainder of Hill Sites District. Mapping it within St. George reflects St. George's evolution into an urban center over the past several decades and the city's plans for the waterfront across Richmond Terrace. Mapping the site into an R73 district provides the additional FAR that can be used to address the area needs. The infusion of approximately 225 units of affordable housing will improve housing opportunities in a community that is significantly rent burdened. 
The addition of public open space will expand outdoor resources available to those who live and work in the neighborhood. And the additional density brings important secondary effects. It provides critical mass of population to support a wider range of retail and cultural offerings. And it advances the city's signature land use policy of promoting higher density in transit rich areas. Finally, the special permit waivers allow envelope controls to be tailored to this unique site in order to provide the best possible site plan and building form. Height and setback waivers will allow public open space where it's most useful. It will facilitate the preservation of green space and the full site areas as visual amenities and view corridors through the site. And the special permit would allow the project its varied skyline and more textured and distinctive design. And with that, we are happy to answer any questions. And, uh, and, and of course, thank you again for allowing us to testify here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions uh, before I turn it over to uh, Council Member Rose uh, for her questions. Uh, and I'm not sure if I'm, I, I missed this, but uh, are you in full control of all the parcels within the special permit boundaries? We are not. So we have control over our parcels and the other parcels are um, you know, under different uh, private ownership. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I heard you say you're not, but- Yes, I we're know. not. We're, we're not uh, um, in control of the properties outside of our site, which uh, you've seen the design for. Uh, but I think, you know, as the um, environmental impact statement looked at, uh, at this area overall, uh, there really is only one site that we believe will develop under the, the proposed rezoning, and that was analyzed as part of, of that uh, document and uh, review. Uh, the other sites within the parcel are either built out or too small or constrained. And um, the site to the north, which is the triangular site, uh, there's no change really within uh, in terms of its density. So it's density neutral, and the rezone is only including it within um, the special St. George district because otherwise it would be an orphan site between within St. George. Um, and you were talking about this uh, before uh, dealing with the F, uh, FAR. Is there any zoning districts in Staten Island that uh, allows for a, uh, a 6.0 FAR in 26 stories? Um, I guess there are two, two issues. One is the FAR and one is the height. Uh, uh, there is no a district that allows um, they are 73 right now in Staten Island, and perhaps it'll never happen. But, uh, but I think it's worthwhile, uh, council members, to understand that uh, that zoning districts there, there's no sort of magic number to zoning districts. I think the questions before your body and for uh, the city planning commission is to see whether a proposed zoning district and the benefits that it uh, entails and its design can fit within the existing context. And I think in this particular case, this site is very unique. And I, that, and I think I just want to be clear, I don't think this, what they're proposing here is going to set a precedent elsewhere within the district. What makes the site so unique is I think a few things. One is that it's, um, it's proximity to, uh, to mass transit and the best mass transit on the island. Uh, the second is that it's the largest site. Third is that it's existing uh, built context really supports a taller building. And I think you won't find that in other parts of Staten Island. So the density and massing is really unique and what, what we believe wholly appropriate for the site because of its existing context. So the site sits um, at the foot of a hill and just behind it is the tallest building in Staten Island, um, which is Castle to, uh, Apartments. And it also sits on a major corridor uh, within uh, St. George. Uh, I, I, the, your answer you is no. There. Okay, right? and one last point yeah. is that it's yeah. also across the, uh, yeah. the side. So the thing. answer is no, right? Correct? Yes, oh, I thought I answered that initially, yes. Okay, okay. thank you, just making sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now, I know you spoke about open spaces earlier. Uh, is there a phasing plan for the construction on the site? Uh, 
I know you you showed on the on the um, uh, presentation uh, that you had a, an open space. Uh, is that currently open now, or is there a schedule um, um, when the open space to the public will be delivered on site? Well, uh, I can answer that question. Uh, uh, this is not a, a large scale, which is phased over you know, multiple years. Uh, there's a construction period uh, that is roughly, I think, two to three years, and, and uh, Zach, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And within that period of construction, all three buildings will be developed. And during that period, both public spaces will be developed. So we're not talking about something that will come online years from now. By the time the development is completed within this period of two, three years, the uh, public spaces will also be delivered. So two, three years before the public uh, open space can be delivered on site. Right, because it's it's uh, it's that's the construction phase uh, of, the, of the project. Okay, is there uh, any way to open the uh, passive open space uh, before the project is fully completed? Um, I mean, we can look at that. It's, uh, it's just, part of it's just sort of logistics because all three there's overlaps between the buildings in terms of the construction. Um, so, you know, it's something that we can definitely consider. Um, and Tony, I don't know if there is that anything's reflected in the restricted deck that speaks to this, but... Um, um, good morning, I'm Tony Finger, Environmental <laughs> Council at Kramer 11. Um, so I do believe that there are conditions in the restrictive deck that um, the open space comes online and I believe it's before occupancy of the third building. Um, so I think the sites have to be constructed first before those open spaces can come online. Okay, um, just two more questions and then I'm gonna turn it over to council member Rose. Uh, what kind of environmental mitigation is required um, for this development? Um, and are there any unmitigated impacts uh, that exist there? Um, yes, yeah, so the environmental impacts consist of, um, there were, there were um, traffic impacts identified at several intersections. Most of them are able to be mitigated with standard measures, which include just signal timing changes. However, during the construction phase and the operational phase, there will be two intersections that remain unmitigated. There will also be construction noise impacts um, to deal with construction noise. The um, applicant has committed to noise reduction measures that go beyond what's required by the New York City Noise Control Code in order to reduce those levels. Um, they are also offering air conditioning units for certain residences that will be affected by noise um, so that they will be allowed to have alternate means of ventilation with a closed window condition so that they wouldn't experience impacts. Um, there will be some unmitigated um, noise impacts at some facades, and I believe that Castleton Park South Playground for some um, limited period of time. But again, construction impacts are temporary. Um, they occur during construction hours, and they are not a constant state. They're intermittent depending on the specific activity that's occurring or the equipment that's being used at that time. So um, how are you going to ensure the construction on the site will not affect uh, traffic congestion uh, on Richmond Terrace, especially at the peak commuting times? Well, there was an analysis that was done for construction traffic. And um, with respect to the um, impacts that were identified, most of them were, again, were able to be mitigated with standard signal timing changes. Um, there are two intersections that are not able to um, be mitigated. Um, and that's Richmond Terrace at Jersey Street and Richmond Terrace at Wall Street. Okay, um, that's it for me. I know we have a, a large number of folks that also uh, are looking to testify. So uh, I'm gonna cut my questions there and uh, turn it over to Council Member Rose um, for questions. 
Thank you, uh, Chair Mobia, um, and, and thank you for uh, your questions. Um, they were spot on. Uh, I appreciate you asking them. Uh, I wanted to know how how do you plan to respond to the local residents' concerns about the precedent-setting density that you know is being requested in this application? As you know, this has been the major issue um, of surrounding this development. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Rose. Um, so to answer that question, well, first, I think it should be clear that any kind of, uh, as you know, any rezoning or mappings that take place uh, would have to go to the full ULA before the community board and before the city planning commission and of course the city council. We feel very strongly that this density uh, and this mapping that we're proposing over here is not going to uh, is not going to create a precedent elsewhere on the island. And uh, there are certain factors that relate to this unique site and its location, uh, which warrants this density. And that includes, as I said before, just its um, proximity to mass transit, uh, the, the ferry terminal, the railway terminal, the, the fast ferry and the bus lines. Um, and so it provides a lot of infrastructure for, for commuters, for people to go to, you know, outside of the island as well as within the island. Um, I think the other thing is that the, the density that goes along with the R7, uh, we understand is greater than what we've seen on the island, but we believe that it can be masked in a way, which uh, is what's proposed over here, and it's supported by the existing contact. So we don't believe there be, you'll find these sites elsewhere which would allow for taller buildings. The, the, this particular site, because you have uh, Castleton uh, Apartments just behind it, it's not only the tallest building, but it's also about 70 to, I think 70 feet above uh, the, the grade at Richmond Terrace. So it sits up top of it over here and we sit at the bottom of the hill and uh, we're on a major uh, corridor and then across the street is, is the formal wheel site. And even though that project uh, may be dormant or may have run away, uh, the, the special St. George district anticipates that, that, that something significant is gonna happen over there. So I think the land uses, the existing context um, and the infrastructure of mass transit really allows uh, the site to be to be rezoned without any real ill effect. Uh, and um, and of course, I Minakshi, think I just want to jump yes. in for one second yes, from the post land that. use. Yes. I guess to more directly answer the council member's question is after our last meeting, FX Collaborative has been working through the night and. We're figuring out a way to respond to the height question um, that we think would be meaningful and you know address your concern. Thank you. Um, I, I look forward to having that conversation uh, about you know um, how we've sort of circled back and and are looking at that. Um, I appreciate that. And, um, uh, you know, I just wanted to say to Manashi, um, I know that you address the, the infrastructure in terms of trans transportation, mm -hmm. um, which would be minimally impacted because as you stated, it's right at the, at, it's, at, it's at our ferry terminal, our major transportation hub. So there really wouldn't be any transportation impact. However, you know, there are other infrastructure issues that would be impacted. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to know how you, you know, how that figures into your equation. Right, I think um, um, one thing is that uh, in terms of in impacts, most of the categories were screened really, and were not analyzed as a part of the, uh, the draft and final EIS. And as Tony mentioned before, um, in terms of traffic, there really are just two intersections that 
are not uh, sort of mitigated. And one of them is actually closer towards Bay Street. And you know, while it's not a part of our project, we recognize and understand that a part of the, the Bay Street rezoning, the city committed to do a, a traffic monitoring uh, for that intersection. So, you know, we believe that this will be that will be addressed in the future with a city planning's monitoring plan. I think the other impacts are really uh, what uh, Tony talked about, which is you know, essentially um, uh, construction impacts and those would be temporary and we are working and have mitigation in place to screen those as well. So if we look at that, you know, overall sort of what are, what are the effects of this project? And we're talking about these two intersections, some potential, I guess, um, you know, in terms of construction, but that would be um, uh, essentially temporary. And then we look at the other side of the equation, and which is about affordability, and uh, such a significant infusion of affordable housing in this in this neighborhood. And we heard what you said, Council Member, about the level of affordability or the amount of affordability, and our team is working on that to see how we can, you know, increase that and address your concerns. But that is a big infusion in the area, uh, which which we think provides significant benefits. And then. I, mean, I don't want to go through all the other issues, but uh, we're obviously providing new open space um, and also just the economic benefits and, and the secondary effects for, for the North Shore and for, you know, to, uh, economically. You and know, thank, thank you, Manash. Sorry, um, um, uh, I wanted to, um, to ask you, uh, as, uh, as every borough in New York City was uh, impacted by, uh, um the remnants of hurricane ida um you know it really brought a lot of attention to um our ability our, our sewers and their ability to to um you know uh contain you know the water um can you just briefly tell us about the runoff and the drainage and um, you know uh, the impacts of building into the the hillside will have on our ability to um, address runoff drainage and you know our sewer capacity. Right. I'm going to turn it over to Dan and Ben. But you know the, uh, the whole approach towards our site has been uh, really about uh, um, you know being good neighbors, both you know, from a sustainable and ecological standpoint. Uh, so uh, we are including measures that will take care of our site, and I'm going to turn that over to um, to Dan and to Ben. Uh, thank you. So um, I, I think uh, a couple of points. Number one is we're maintaining 50% of the site as as unbuilt areas, so that there will be um, a recharge of the uh, groundwater. Secondly, um, we're creating uh, uh, a new sidewalk with uh, 28 trees with bioswales at the base. And third, we'll have either an on-site uh, uh, cistern or, and or blue roofs, which retain water so that um, really that this site should be a model for stormwater management. Okay. Um, could you provide me with the, um, the proposed bedroom mix you know, of the development, that was something that came up at our um, our meeting. Can you provide that? Everybody has deer in the headlight looks, so no, I guess not. No, we're just okay a, at our next meeting. Yeah, okay. We we can provide that to you. Uh, yeah. Um, Prior. and you know, um. We did talk about the uh, affordable, um, increasing the affordable, the affordability um, amounts for this development. Uh, have we explored that yet? Correct. Uh, so we heard you loud and clear, and we're just looking at our underwriting. And uh, again, in response to the height concerns, you'll have uh, a response that addresses uh, your comment on increased affordability as well. 
Okay. And have you had any conversations with any businesses or um, community organizations that uh, who might tenant the commercial and community facility sites? And, and is there enough square footage to actually um, provide a grocery store or daycare facility on that site? So just to clarify, it's not community facility, it's retail we're talking about. And actually in the last two weeks, we've had a few local uh, daycare centers on Staten Island who I believe have two uh, or three existing establishments reach out to us and express interest in opening in St. George. And when we looked at rough square footages, uh, building three would almost be a perfect fit for that use. And then uh, for the retail space in building one, we've actually had a few brokers reach out on behalf of their clients who own and operate supermarkets on the island and are interested in finding, you know, using building one's retail location um, for their establishment. So it sounds like two of the uses that we've been talking about for a while have expressed interest. Obviously, we've discussed how challenging it is this far out in the process but it's exciting for us and obviously for the community that two of our targeted uses already were the first out of the gates to connect with us on opportunities at River North. All right. I know that uh, a lot of grocery stores have a certain square footage requirement. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, the retail space could accommodate uh, those square footage, you know, um, needs. That's a yes. Understood. Okay. Um, and, and how will uh, cars uh, enter and exit this property? Where are the- Ben, ben you uh, wanna take it? Yeah, I'm happy to, to walk everybody through. Um, so there will be uh, three parking facilities um, and two of which are actually within one building. It's just, there is no connection between those independent facilities in that one building. So in building one, which is the building closest to the St. George uh, Ferry Terminal, there will be one parking en um, entrance on Hamilton that actually brings cars onto the second story. And that will at, uh, utilize uh, a parking facility on floors two and three of building one. On Stuyvesant Place, uh, 50, uh, beyond 53 feet from the intersection of Stuyvesant Place and Richmond Terrace, there will be an entry into a below grade parking facility in building one. And then in building three, uh, at the furthest um, northwest portion of the site, there will be an entrance off of Richmond Terrace to access parking on um, the second and third story of that building. And in total, uh, in, we're, we're you know, budgeting about 340 spaces. Um, you know, and that's what's required per zoning, but, you know, as, you know, design occurs, we'll, we'll look to, to provide as much parking that can fit in the, in the space, but we are providing the, the required. So there's no parking in building two at all. Building two is the smallest building footprint. Um, and, you know, the two parking facilities are within, you know, a 50 foot or to a hundred foot walk. Um, so, you know, and on, on the same kind of campus. So we would look to create pathways uh, to bring users, uh, residents to those other parking facilities. Will those pathways be internal or? It, it's, it's, you know, the component. It, it would be a combination. You know, we want to avoid unnecessary excavation. So, you know, out, out or, you know, outdoor paths or, you know, potentially below grade paths connecting is something that we're looking into. Okay, um, Chair, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to ask these questions. I know that my community has um, questions, so, and I will be meeting with this development team, so, and I'll get any answers that I need. So thank you uh, again for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman uh, Rose. Uh, I now want to uh, just check with our council to see if uh, we have any other colleagues that may have questions for this panel. Uh, no, Chair Moya, I see no members with questions for this panel. 
Okay. Um, seeing that there are no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the River North rezoning application? Mr. Chair, we have approximately 22 public witnesses who have signed up to speak. Okay. For members of the public here to testify, please note again that witnesses will generally be called in groups of up to four names at a time. If you are a member of the public who has signed up to testify on the River North rezoning proposal, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the chair says that you may begin. Please note again, once, on, once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed from the meeting as a group and the next group uh, the next group of speakers will be introduced. Once removed, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing on the council website. We will now hear from the first panel, which will include Vincent Acornero, Deborah Givens, Helen Northmore and John Kilcullen. The first speaker on the panel will be Vincent Acronero, followed by Deborah Gibbons. Starting time. Just a reminder uh, to members of the public, um, you will have two minutes uh, to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. Uh, before we start, uh, I see Council Member Rose has her hand up, I'm sorry. We unmute Council Member Rose. Uh, Hold on, Council Member. Let, let's, uh, we got to unmute you. Uh, um, Chair, I just wanted to ask before um, the, the, the public testifies if we could ask the, um, the, developer, the development team to stay to hear the testimony? Yeah, I think we, we may have lost them, uh, Councilwoman. Okay. Um, I All right. Apologize. I'm, I'm sorry. I, no, I it's okay. I should have mentioned it before. I, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, we will now begin with uh, Vincent. Starting time. Vincent, whenever you're ready, uh, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Vincent Acanero, Chairman of the Land Use Committee for Community Board 1, Staten Island. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Council Member Rose, good afternoon. Uh, this is a letter that we addressed to Council Member Rose containing a resolution that was passed near unanimously by Community Board 1 regarding the River North application. As you know, Community Board 1 had preliminary discussions with the developer and hosted an extremely lengthy and comprehensive public hearing that was well attended and provided voluminous testimony. Also, the Land Use Committee and full board spent time prior to familiar, familiarize themselves with the proposal. After discussion and debate, Community Board 1 unanimously approved the following resolution. Whereas this application seeks to rezone the proposed area from an R6 C2 district within the Special Hillsides Preservation District to an R7 C3 slash C24 within the Special St. George District. And whereas this application is in the Special Hillside Preservation District, which was designed to give oversight to building in steep slope. And whereas the application seeks to obliterate the Special Hillside Preservation District in an area of the steepest slope in Community Board 1, and whereas it is unprecedented for any proposal to be removed from this district, and whereas the existing R6 district provides the greatest bulk and height of any district in Staten Island, whereas the special St. George district provides parking and other development controls designed and adopted specifically for this area, and whereas this development is asking for multiple authorizations and waivers all intended to maximize density and bulk in a district that can be developed without this extreme contorted level of relief, 
whereas this application has been extremely fast-tracked through the Department of City Planning and will saddle new representatives and administration with a decision that should be left for them, be it hereby resolved, Community Board 1 opposes all the actions proposed by this application and strongly suggests they build within the existing zoning control so as not to completely disregard all previously crafted zoning. I'm expired. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Next, we have uh, Deborah. Starting time. Can we uh, unmute Deborah? Mute. Yes. There you go, Deborah. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, committee Chair Moya, uh, Council Member Debbie Rose, and Council Members of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. My name is Deborah Gibbons, and I'm here to oppose the project. I'm a former Staten Islander, born and raised and educated on Staten Island, and I'm here to speak on behalf of all the Staten Islanders who are missing this opportunity to testify due to short notice, as this application is being pushed through the approval process with some level of expediency unheard of. Um, as City Planning Commissioner Cerullo stated during the last uh, CPC sessions on this matter, the, the emphasis has been on the height of the, the, the build, these buildings, and that's a major concern, and it should be, but this has been to the exclusion of discussing other objectionable aspects of this project this large, and many were identified in the final EIS. Um, my concerns and objections are divided into two. First, um, the lack of transparency in many forms. Um, first, the lack of true community engagement by the applicant. Um, you know, where were the sit downs, workshops, uh, public meetings and feel good sessions inviting the community into the project. Uh, two, the lack of scrutiny. Um, this application is skating through the approval process ahead of comprehensive planning considerations and the racial equity analysis that is so desired by the city council and that was introduced in 2019 with an eye on future projects. Um, a project of this size should be reviewed through the new critical lenses as it will be completed well into the future. And three, the lack of disclosure of the housing specifics, uh, no floor plans, no housing unit designs, no breakdown on the number of apartments by household size and income were made available, and nor was there an as of right scenario in rendings or drawings as requested by the commission. I tell you, these are not good signs. Uh, my other major concern is the MIH option two being proposed um, as this project was going through the approval process. One option one was mentioned, but it seems to have uh, been Time expired. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Council, who's the next panelist? Sorry. The next speaker will be Helen Northmore, who will be followed by John Kilcullen. And Chair, I just would like to make a, a brief te technical announcement. Uh, for members of the public, if you have already completed the registration process and you have successfully logged into the Zoom meeting and you are here waiting to testify, there should be no reason uh, to use the raise hand function just for sorting uh, logistical purposes. We'll ask that you uh, not raise your hand. If you have raised your hand, please lower it. Your name will be called uh, in order uh, once it's your turn to speak and your ability to speak will be enabled once your turn is called. Uh, thank you. The next speaker, Helen Northmore, who will be followed by John Kilcullen. Starting time. Without harmful zoning concessions for River North with its unmitigated adverse effects, more than 1,000 units of affordable housing are already predicted by the city in the up-zoned up -zoned Staten Island areas which start across the street, the St. George Special District, the Bay Street Corridor District, and the Special Stapleton Waterfront District. Madison Realty Capital plans to squeeze 750 apartments, 1,800 people, and 340 plus automobiles into three buildings bordering Richmond Terrace. 
The North Shore Rail Line was shut down in 1953. So approximately 73% of North Shore Transit riders use the bus to get to work. The S40 bus running along Richmond Terrace is the primary route. The MTA says Richmond Terrace is already inadequate, inadequate for the traffic on it. About 30% of all S40 trips are already late throughout the day, making ferry connections difficult. When the roads are too congested, the proposed traffic signal timing won't work. Research has been done. Three plus years of construction will make things worse. The Castleton Park Apartments property containing its sewer lines right of way actually bisects the River North's buildings one and building two as seen on the illustrations today. Has the New York City Housing Development Corporation given its opinion on Madison Realty Capital's plan to buy the Castleton Park Apartments? Park of property since HDC floated over $70 million in loans and bonds for Castleton Park apartments mortgages. If the zoning is changed now, thereby inflating the cost of the land in St. George, what is the guarantee that even a single River North dwelling will be completed? Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for your testimony today. The last speaker on this panel will be John Kilcullen. John Kill Colin. Starting time. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Moya and Zoning Franchise Committee subcommittee, subcommittee Council Member and Council Member Rose. Uh, thank you for holding the hearing today regarding items uh, River North. Uh, my name is John Kill Colin. And I am in opposition to all three agenda items. As you may have heard, Staten Islanders, including our borough president, community board one, many local civic associations, and our own Staten Island commissioner on the city planning commission are opposed to this rezoning. It's not as of right development of the said property. The argument against rezoning isn't about intention of property owners develop their property, affordable housing, or supposed level of a neighborhood. It is proposed rezoning is too large and the wrong location. And the alteration of a hard fought and much treasured zoning district, the special hillside protection district is uh, please note the Castleton Park towers predate the special district and actually sit on the flattest part of this area of St. George. Uh, At this time, Staten Island does not need R7 zoning, the recently rezoned St. George High District, High Zone District, and the newly rezoned Bay Street Quarter not include R7 zoning and have not been fully developed or maxed out. In fact, many developers have not taken advantage of the St. George High Rise District development and the glut of unfinished or failed development projects, including the wheel and Lighthouse Point, like the fact that Staten Island does not need this up zoning. This is simply a case of a developer crime part before construction starts, and their only concern is to maximize their end profits, not the community. And I'd like to point out that the river, uh, point, so the river, the view uh, that they talk adjacent is the commercial. Time expired. Since 2012 has not been. Thank you for your. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for your testimony uh, today. Uh, are there uh, any uh, council members who have any questions for this uh, panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. This panel is now excused. Thank you again for your testimony. Um, if you can please call up the next panel. Just a, once again, as a reminder um, for all members of the public who have successfully registered and logged into the meeting, uh, there should be no need to uh, use the raise hand function. Everyone will have a chance to be called uh, in order. The next panel will include Renzo Ramirez, Leticia Ramoro, Dr. Demetrius Carolina, and Nikki Adlovac. We'll start the panel with Renzo Ramirez, followed by Leticia Ramoro. Starting time.
Starting time. Right. Good afternoon, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Renzo Ramirez and I am a member of 32BJ SEIU. I am here today on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed River North project. 32BJ is the largest property service union in the country, representing 85,000 property service workers in New York City, including janitors, security guards, handy persons, and supers that work in buildings similar to the proposed River North project. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. I'm happy to report that the developers affiliated with River North Madison Realty Capital have made a cre credible commitment to creating prevailing wage building service jobs at this site. This commitment means that workers in Staten Island will have access to family sustaining wages, retirement and quality health benefits in a time where New Yorkers need them the most. We estimate that the mixed use development like the one proposed by the developer will be permanently staffed by an estimated 20 building service workers. The River North, will, the River North project will also have approximately 225 affordable housing units in accordance with the mandatory inclusionary housing program. Building new permanently affordable housing in a centrally, in a centrally located area with access to mass transit is important to our members and their families. For these reasons, we are in full support of this project. We have full confidence that Madison Realty Capital will be a responsible employer and presence in the community. For these reasons, we respectfully urge you to approve the rezoning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Renzo. Thank you for your testimony today. Next, we will hear from Leticia Romoro, who will be followed by Dr. Demetrius Carolina. Starting time. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, thank you for letting me speak and thank you chairman uh, and to our council member Debbie Rose. Failure to plan is failing is is planning to fail. And unfortunately on Staten Island, we have failed at planning and that failure has uh, caused us to have homeless shelters spring up in residential neighborhoods right next to uh, elementary schools. It's caused us to have uncharacteristic buildings being shoved into neighborhoods where they don't belong. Um, and we, and th this failure to plan has comes because we're fearful of what might happen and next. I am here to ask for Council Member Rose and the rest of the committee to really consider a negotiation on this um, site. A a, you know, th this project is uh, surrounded by buildings that are taller. This project is uh, going to provide for seniors and young people a place where they can live. And up until now, too many of our young people and our seniors have been pushed off of Staten Island because we don't have rental apartments or affordable rentals. Um, when, you, when you have a responsible development at plan in front of us, it is really important that we take a look at how to make this work. Uh, again, Castleton Park apartments uh, are, are tall. Um, we have the accolades, we have Irby, we have wonderful uh, areas where we can make things work and this is the right place next to public transportation. This is a place where young people can stay on Staten Island before they get married and buy a home. Uh, this is a place where seniors can retire and sell their home and have a place to live right next to the Staten Island Ferry. This is a walkable neighborhood and this project actually fits into this neighborhood because not everywhere on, on Staten Island is suitable for a tall building. Um, and so we must recognize that the Bay Street Corridor, the Richmond Terrace Corridor- I'm expired are the places that we should look for these projects. And I urge you to take a good look at this project and to negotiate. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you for your uh, testimony today. The next speaker on the panel will be Dr. Demetrius Carolina, who will be followed by Nikki Adlovac. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair uh, Moya, certainly to our phenomenal Councilwoman, Debbie Rose, and certainly to the subcommittee. My name is the Reverend Dr. Demetrius Carolina, Executive Director of the largest black and brown nonprofit in Staten Island and pastor of the First Central Baptist Church. I uh, am here to support the development of the uh, River North project. And I am just asking this committee and our council person and all those 
in Staten Island to consider the fact that now is a time for monumental change and opportunity has come for us to really think out of the box, to rethink development, and to also think about the social determinants of economic uh, well-being of this borough and the community yet to come. As was mentioned before, this is a unique area in the borough, and this development may not necessarily open the door for equal uh, types of development in other areas of the borough, because we understand that is not a, necessarily a reality. But one thing that is a reality, we need development, especially in a historically underserved and underdeveloped area on the North Shore of Staten Island. This is a walkable community and with proper negotiations, planning, discussions and meetings, I'm certain that we, an intelligent, wonderful, thriving borough can come to some amenable uh, solutions for this development project. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but let's sit down and make some meaningful development plans for the future, not just for us who are presently here, but for those who are yet to come. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The last speaker on this panel will be Nikki Odlovac. Starting time. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Nikki Odlovac and I'm president and CEO of Community Agency for Senior Citizens, better known as CASC. Also, I am a resident of the St. George neighborhood on Staten Island for almost 40 years and have been working in St. George for over 20 years. CASC has been serving older adults aged 60 years and older and their caregivers since 1985. And we provide assistance to seniors to remain as independent as possible and thrive in their Staten Island community by providing different kinds of services. I'm cutting my, my testimony. You have my written testimony. CAS programs assist eight, over 8,000 people annually, and we expect that number to rise with baby boomers aging at an unprecedented rate. Some advocates have called it a tsunami of aging older adults. One of the most frequent questions CAS receives from senior callers and their families is how can we access affordable housing? Unfortunately, there's no good news on this subject. CAS assists with housing applications for local affordable housing, but wait lists are long years and, and the available apartments at an affordable right, rate are few. I'm here to support River North Liberty Towers development. It is long time overdue that our beautiful waterfront is developed into an exciting, thriving and welcoming North Shore. We need the housing, we need housing for seniors who can no longer live in private homes. We need housing for seniors who are being asked to leave apartments in two and four families because after 20 to 30 years of living there, the families are now selling these private dwellings or they can get much more rent from new tenants. We need more housing for young adults who are just starting their careers but cannot afford moving out of their parents' homes. And we need more housing for young families where it is safe place to live and flourish. There's more in my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for your testimony today. Is that the last of our panelists? That was the last speaker on this panel, yes. Uh, is there uh, any council members who have questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions uh, for the panel. Okay, there being no more questions uh, for this panel, the witness panel is uh, now excused. Uh, thank you all for your patience today and thank you for uh, coming here to testify. Um, Council, if you could please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Linda Cohen, Camilla Hanks, Michael Harwood, and Sally Jones. We'll begin with Linda Cohen, followed by Camilla Hanks. Starting time. Speakers are being brought in. Uh, once again, we'll start with Linda Cohen, followed by Camila Hanks.
excuse me, Chair, the first speaker on this panel will, will take Camila Hanks uh, to start, who will be followed by Michael Harwood. Camila Hanks. Starting time. Good morning, Chair Moya, members of the of the Zoning and Franchises Subcommittees and Council members, Council Member Rose and community members that are here today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I joined Community Board One, several of my elected officials, community stakeholders, and many residents of the North Shore in opposition of the River North project. My commentary, much like what you'll hear to say, it is, is the same, it'll be brief, and, and on both sides. I've been a long time proponent of creating a master plan that uses sensible development that takes into consideration the contextual architecture of the existing neighborhood that, and builds responsibly and has real community benefits and provides affordability that is inclusive on all income levels. To that end, the Madison Realty um, Capitals River North projects in its current iteration does not address any of the above. This project raises deep concerns with building heights and current placement being built on Richmond Terrace is yet another example of our district being planned in piecemeal with no consideration of long-term impacts on our infrastructure, our schools, public transportation options, roads, sewers, healthcare facilities, and most importantly, our community. While Madison is proposing zoning variants for three buildings, 25, 26, and 11 stories, our communities are dealing with the devastating realities of flood damage, homeless shelters, broken street, vacant storefronts, and long commutes. The promise of our waterfront and St. George district are becoming as faded as the coming soon window decals that adorn many of the defunct development projects. The city council has the last word on the, the approval process and the city council at its core was tasked with representing the interests of its constituents, the residents of the city of New York. The residents of the St. George neighborhood have declared their opposition to this project and for good reason. I urge city council to support the residents of the North Shore and vote against the North Shore uh, River project in its current form. We deserve better. And I encourage the developers to consider thoughtful, our thoughtful commentaries offered today and resubmit a proposal that reflects the demands of our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Camilla. Good to see you. Thank you so Good much. Good to see you too. Today. Thank you. Be Thank well. you. The next speaker will be Michael Harwood, followed by Sally Jones. Starting time. Good afternoon. River North and R7 zoning is wrong for St. George, wrong for the North Shore, and wrong for Staten Island. It's also wrong for the cause of affordable housing. The only people it's right for are the developers and the real estate interests. And I say that as a homeowner as well as a landlord of 12 units in St. George. Current R6 zoning would allow 176 apartment units, which is in keeping with the zoning changes that are recently enacted. This project seeks to explode that zoning to 900 units, a 500% increase above R6. It would also increase the allowed height nearly 800%. Uh, that means this upzoning would be a property value gift by the city to this developer of nearly a quarter billion dollars in value. And what public amenity are they offering in return? Practically nothing. No waterfront promenade, no school. There's no room for parking for this hypothetical grocery, school, grocery store. Um, and there's minimal space, mostly public space, mostly for the residents. Their offer of 30% units for affordable housing is also illusory. Studio and one bedroom apartments starting at $1,700 a month are only slightly below the existing market rate already. And I know that as a landlord in the neighborhood. But adding over 700 new market rate units will actually displace existing borderline groups in this neighborhood. The city council recently approved the St. George rezoning and Bay Street Carter rezoning, which, design, which are designed to provide several hundred units of affordable housing more appropriately distributed through the area instead of cramming all these units in one location. And this gift of over $200 million in value will be an invitation to other developers to build more R7 projects here and all over the area near the ferry terminal. St. George already has a population density of 19,000 people per square mile. And if you add another 2,000 residents here, will be triple the density of the rest of the island, even before these other projects come online. We don't need massive density increases. We need open space consistent with the existing hillside topography and public amenities that'll encourage future residents and businesses to locate here because of the neighborhood character. We need responsible planning consistent with the existing zoning that integrates the- Time expired. And as the community board unanimously voted, this neighborhood is opposed to this project in its entirety. And I urge the, council, the committee to vote against. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for your testimony today. The next speaker will be Sally Jones, and then we will try to get Linda Cohen again. Next speaker, Sally Jones. Starting time. 
Thank you, uh, Chair Moya and my council member, Debbie Rose. My name is Sally Jones. I am a member of the St. George Civic Association, the Staten Island Democratic Association. I'm on the board of the Unitarian Church of Staten Island. I'm a founding member of Peace Action of Staten Island, as well as other civic groups. I live at 110 Hamilton Avenue, up the street from the proposed project. I have lived in our 1910 home for 43 years since August 1979 across the street from Curtis High School. I am opposed to this River North project for the following reasons. Its height and density is out of scale with the neighborhood of mostly one to four family homes and smaller scale apartment buildings. It violates hard fought for zoning protections to protect the hillside and harbor views. It pushes the St. George waterfront into a high rise building syndrome. It will create very few sustainable jobs. It comes on top of other in limbo projects that we live with one to three pro uh, blocks from the project, the never built wheel, the sparsely visited empire outlets, the huge, empty, unfinished block long garage that is right across the street and which is also ugly. It, the uncompleted hotel next to the ferry term, terminal whose construction was stopped due to bankruptcy. The, com the community's vision of the waterfront is for public access, green space and maintaining stunning harbor views. It should not be built up with high rises and make us upwardly look alike. I urge this committee and the city council to deny this project. Thank you, Sally. Thank you for your testimony today. And we will now try to hear from Linda Cohen once again. Linda Cohen. Starting time. Do we have Linda? I do see Linda Cohen. Linda Cohen, if you can hear us, uh, we'll ask that you accept a invitation to unmute if you see one so that we can take your testimony. Okay, we appear to be having some issues with Linda Cohen, Chair. We will try to get her testimony in a subsequent panel. Right. And that okay. concludes the current panel. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, well, let me just check, does uh, uh, any council members have any questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with uh, questions for this panel. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I thank you all for uh, your patience today and thank you very much for your testimony um, during this hearing. Uh, this panel is now excused. Uh, Council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel uh, will consist of Dale Smith, followed by Elizabeth Morgan, followed by Cesis Cruz, followed by Reverend Judy L. Brown. The first speaker on this panel, we will hear from Dale Smith. Starting time. Yes. Yes, good morning to the members of the Zoning and Franchise Subcommittee and to our great Councilwoman Debbie Rolls. Hello, I'm Reverend Dale Smith, and I'd like to thank you for having me today. And I'm leadership counselor at Youth Bill of Impact and a reverend for the Presidential Baptist Church. I am here today in support of the proposed River North Project in Staten Island. At leadership counselor at Youth Bill of Impact, I am responsible for supporting the program participants and their personal development. 
I work with local youth and set achieve in the academic and leadership development goals through structural activities, lessons, workshops, and events. We also provide ongoing counseling, support services, and guidance so they can achieve success. At the heart of my work as local staff now youth, I'm committed to supporting the development and growth of responsible residents in the community. But it's also important that every child's community supports him or her and has resources necessary for them to succeed. Therefore, I support River North. Children and teenagers growing up in Staten Island should be able to grow up in stable homes, ones that parents or ones that parent or parents can afford. They should have community spaces and public open spaces where they can play, learn, and enjoy the neighborhood, breaking the cycle of poverty. Many of our community members include students are homeless who are homeless, and this would provide them with affordable housing that is so desperately needed for them to have a brighter future. The North Shore has grown tremendously in recent years. We welcome change, but most be mindful that long-term residents don't get left behind. The River North provides inclusivity. Please help the North Shore grow in a substantial way by meeting the needs of new existing residents and ensuring that the youth of today have opportunities in the future. I thank you for that time. Thank you, Dale. Thank you for your testimony. The next speaker on this panel will be Elizabeth Morgan. Elizabeth Morgan, who will then be followed by Acesis Cruz. Starting good, time. Afternoon. good afternoon, members of the Zoning and Franchise Subcommittee and our phenomenal leader, Council Member Debbie Rose. My name is Elizabeth Morgan, and I'm speaking today in support of River North. In my role at the Central Family Life Center, I am the director of the Youthful Impact Program, which provides youth ages 17 to 24 with an opportunity to earn their high school equivalency diploma, construction skills, leadership soft skills, and, other, and offers other social services. River North presents the North Shore with a unique opportunity for 225 units of newly constructed, income-based, affordable housing, and approximately 7,800 square foot public plaza and significant visual and safety improvements to the streets from front and sidewalk along Richmond Terrace and Stuyvesant Place, all developed in an equitable manner. River North will achieve the equity in part through its partnership with Youthful Impact. Youthful Impact has begun working with River North project partner, Building Skills New York, to place Staten Islanders in construction jobs, including those created by the project. When River North is approved, I look forward to continuing our work with Building Skills New York and the project team to harness the economic and career opportunities that River North will create for young people on the North Shore. Additionally, located near multiple means of public transportation, including the ferry terminal, River North will be positioned to draw visitors to our community where they can support the numerous businesses, restaurants, and cultural institutions that the island has to offer. I'm urging you to vote to support River North. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker on the panel will be Isisis Cruz, who will be followed by the Reverend Julie, Judy Brown. Starting time. Good afternoon, dear members of the Zone and Franchise Committee. My name is Isis Cruz. I'm 20 years old, NYCHA resident who lives in Staten Island, New York for the past six years. I support the River North project and very much would like to see it move forward. It will bring housing and jobs to the community. I would love to have the opportunity to move into my own apartment into one of these beautiful new homes that are affordable as well. Over the past year, I'm proud to say that I was able to achieve my high school equivalency through Youth Build Impact. As a graduate from the class of 2021, I am grateful to the many new opportunities that have opened up for me. After achieving my diploma, I went on to receive my community health working certification. Today, with my high school diploma and my health certificate, I am fortunate to be interning with Northwell Health. This pandemic has been hard, but it's also made it clear how important the health industry is, and I am honored to be a part of that world now. Over the past year and a half, I've been able to turn my life around. I have also seen my dreams develop. River North is an opportunity for young adults like myself to pursue their dreams, where they can afford to live and be a part of a growing community in Staten Island. Although I've followed the health career in Youthville, my peers are, in, are on the construction track and are looking forward to working alongside architects, contractors, and being offered job opportunities. This has never been... This has never happened on North Shore for youth like me. I hope you will support this project and give young 
Staten Island the opportunity to stay in their home barrels while still having the access to resources and jobs needed to succeed. Thank you. I am urging you to vote to support River North. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you again for your testimony today. We'll call up the next panelist. The next panelist, the next and final panelist for this panel will be the Reverend Judy Brown. Starting time. Um, Judy Revenue. Brown, we can see you, uh, Judy Brown, uh, if you see any requests to, there we go. Yep. Yes, good, good afternoon, all. My name is the Reverend Judy L. Brown, and I am, um, <clears throat> I am the senior pastor of the Bethel Community Church in Tompkinsville, as well as the executive director of the African Refuge. Um, I am here to support River North because, you know, in the climate that we live in, I really cannot say no to housing. Housing is the essential right, and so housing is needed. Um, I do believe that there is some negotiations that's needed and some additional conversations that are needed to make the project work. I believe that uh, River North will... Um, bring labor to the island, the developers uh, willing to work with the community as well as bring union jobs as well as have an open shop and um, we'll work with nonprofits. And, and so it has many, many uh, valuable parts to it. Um, and so I just want to say that um, this is a unique opportunity and if we can work it out so that there is um, housing that is meeting the requirements of our city councilwoman, Debbie Rose, and meeting uh, the requirements of our community, then we have a win-win. I want to thank you for your time. I am kind of rushed this morning, but thank you so much. I think this is going to be a wonderful addition to the island. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, is that the last <laughs> panelist? Yes, that was the last speaker on this panel. Great. Do we have any council members that wish to ask this panel any questions? I see no members with uh, questions for the panel. Okay, there being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And council, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will be Jan Kohler, David Jones, and Theo Dorian. Starting with Jan Kohler, who will be followed by David Jones. Starting time. I'm not sure if I chose the right thing. Um, I'm not sure if I'm being heard. I'm a resident. I've lived in this neighborhood for most of the past 50 years. I've seen all of these spectacular failures. In fact, one of them sits in the middle of my panoramic view. It's a 20 story unfinished empty hulk. Before Starting another project, why not finish what we have? How about the building at the base of Nicholas Street? Is that full? That sat empty for years and years. Who's going to live here? Who's going to take all these apartments? What I see is a neighborhood that has really no urban amenities. They don't exist here. And people moving into a place like that are going to expect that. So 
that's all I have to say. I don't feel real good about this. I don't think the neighborhood is ready for it. And I don't think it will be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, I just want to acknowledge you've been joined by um, Councilwoman uh, Rivera. I know that uh, you had a previous, uh, chairing a previous committee uh, and uh, I want to take a pause right here uh, to see if we can uh, just quickly take um, her vote and proceed from here. Yes, Chair, on a continuing vote of the land use items, Council Member Rivera. If we can unmute uh, the Councilwoman, yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, I vote aye. Chair, the vote currently stands at six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. We will continue to keep the vote open uh, until the end. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. And the next speaker on this panel will be David Jones, who will be followed by Theo Dorian. Starting time. Yes, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. So much of what I have to say uh, has been shared by my uh, fellow neighbors. Uh, and much of uh, my objection to this project uh, has been stated, both height, uh, height realities, lack of amenities, um, uh, Oh, just the, the general inappropriateness of this particular project. Uh, Stat, uh, Staten Island St. George, uh, I was one of the principals involved in uh, bringing on the historic district. Uh, it, didn't, uh, it didn't go as far as we would have liked to, but it was with the idea in mind of both appreciation for the architecture and the quality of life uh, that uh, uh, so uh, made St. George what it is today. Um, yes, the neighborhood's walkable, the neighborhood's wonderful. Most people know each other, surprisingly. Uh, it, it's unlike a great many communities. It is not New York City. It is not Brooklyn. It is not any of the uh, Queens or any of those places. This is a very unique spot. Much of our uh, view uh, areas have been robbed. We've been robbed of our uh, view corridors, uh, our views, the spectacular views we've held here. Um, have been uh, uh, taken away. Um, and uh, we are not Fort Lee, New Jersey. Uh, this is, uh, we're, we are not a cookie cutter community where we're all crammed in here. I, the supporters are people who do not live here, who do not really understand what St. George is about. I appreciate their interests for their, their programs and, and the, the work that they do. But uh, it, it is, uh, we already are saturated with programs as it, as it were. And I'm expired. I'm, thank you. Thank you. I, you, can, you can wrap it up if you were about to end right there. Uh, give you a couple more well, seconds. Well, I, I was just going to say, uh, uh, we've supported Project Hospitality. We've supported uh, Starlight and and many many others. We uh, we uh, uh, to close this out. I guess um, uh, we need to have more input from the people who will be affected by uh, this this proposal and this project has been fast tracked, and we need to put the brakes on this. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Let's call it the next panelist. The next and final panelist for this group will be Theo Dorian. Starting time. Um, hello, uh, my name is Theo Dorian. I'm the president of the St. George Civic Association and um, our association opposes both the proposed zoning change and the proposed development. I heard several speakers today um, talk about the need for engagement with the community. And indeed, Madison Capital was uh, eagerly 
and, uh, and frequently pursuing us and our members uh, at the onset of this project, um, when we presented our um, list of objections, a few of which I might have a moment to share with you, uh, we never heard from them again. None of us have had any engagement with them. It literally stopped the moment, um, the moment we have opposed this plan. All of the people who have spoken in favor of it today, I note, have been clergy and people from programs outside of St. George. And I, like the previous speaker, wholeheartedly um, endorse and applaud their missions. But a general effort to bring more people to the neighborhood should not be concentrated on this area. There are parts of our neighborhood that can effectively hold taller, denser construction with our, without harm to the existing infrastructure and arrive at protections, but this is emphatically not one of them. Speaker Letitia Romero mentioned that it's surrounded by tall buildings. This is extremely untrue. Uh, to date, no, da no down or mid-hill construction, anything east of Hamilton Avenue has been higher than the neighboring houses. And the buildings across the street, the tallest of them are four to six stories. The very tallest are at the crest of that hill and they already place an incredibly heavy burden on the traffic patterns and the uh, water supply and other uh, factors in that area. So uh, the, um, this, was, this falls in a district that was only recently rezoned as a special district. And since that time, there has been no construction in the area. The, under the current zoning- Time expired. Completely, completely possible to build a reasonable project that fulfills the goals of many of, uh, of everybody who spoke today without having to place this extraordinary burden on a block that already is the densest neighborhood of Staten Island. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, we'll hear from one final speaker on this panel. Uh, Richenda Kramer will be next. Richenda Kramer. Starting time. Hello. Hi. Oh, okay. Um, it doesn't have video. Um, I'm a Staten Islander. I live in the St. George area about a quarter of a mile from the ferry. And I totally oppose this project. Um, the, Bay Street land, uh, the Bay Street Development Plan is planning several hundred apartments that they're putting up. We've already got two Irby projects that are a quarter of a mile on the other side of the ferry from this proposed project that are not, um, they haven't been able to hold their tenants um, and they're very empty apart from all the affordable apartments there. Um, there have been other buildings, there was a building at the bottom of um, Victory Boulevard that also took about it was um, it took Sandy to make people buy in it um, to rent the, those apartments. There's um, the, there are no services in this area, and I don't see it would be possible to put a supermarket in this project, which would need access for. I mean, supermarkets have several large deliveries a day, and it doesn't sound as if it's going to be possible for them to move in and out of something as the streets that Hamilton Avenue would be impossible because of the hill. Stuyvesant thing, um, the Stuyvesant and Victory and Richmond Terrace are extremely busy. Um, and Stuyvesant place isn't really, can't really take a truck going up that, up there. I mean, I don't understand, and, and Richmond Terrace, as was already noted, is very busy with um, two bus services. It's also on the route from the bus depot at on at Rector Street. Um, I'm expired. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, is that the last uh, panelist for this panel? Yes, Chair. Sure. Uh, any council members uh, that have questions for this panel? Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, there being no more questions for 
This panel, the witness panel is now excused. And counsel, if you can please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Stephanie Echeverrieta, Benjamin Donsky, Neil Berry, and Joseph Cacarno. First from Stephanie Echeverrieta, followed by Benjamin Donsky. Starting time. Can everyone hear me? All right, Stephanie, uh, we got a big echo here, so hold on one second. Stephanie, if you have two devices connected with audio, perhaps we could try uh, muting one of those. Stephanie, I think um, we'll, we'll try to come back for you in this panel, uh, but again, we'll recommend that if you have two devices uh, connected to this meeting, perhaps we should tr we'll try muting one of them and speaking through the other. And we'll come back to you. We'll go to Benjamin Donsky and then Neil Barry. Starting time. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Benjamin Donsky. I'm an urban planner, but uh, today I'm here as a Staten Island resident who is concerned with both ho housing affordability and protecting our environment. And because of that, I am strongly in favor of the River North proposal. While some Staten Islanders like to think that our relative geographic isolation translates to being insulated from the city's larger economy, that is simply not the case. Uh, it's increasingly difficult for young families like mine to afford to live here. Families are priced out of apartments that have multiple bedrooms because roommates with uh, two incomes and no kids can afford to, to pay more in rent. Uh, and the problem on the North Shore is particularly acute because it's the part of the island that is most impacted by rising rents in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Uh, while this project won't solve our housing shortage all by itself, it is part of a much larger solution, not only for the borough, but for the entire city. We also need to relieve pressure to develop wetlands and environmentally sensitive areas in Staten Island and concentrating residential density near major tra uh, public transit facilities will help to begin to correct this unsustainable course that we're on. I'm personally the owner of a two unit house in walking distance of a Staten Island railroad stop. The second unit is a one bedroom apartment. And while increasing the number of transit uh, accessible one bedroom apartments is against my own direct immediate financial interests. I want my kids to be able to afford to live nearby when they become adults. And I recognize the importance of this project um, for the greater community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin, for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Neil Barry and then Joseph Kakamo. Starting time. Hello, my name is Neil Barry. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you, Neil. Yes, um, I thank you for the opportunity to talk in front of this uh, zoning, and I thank Councilman Rose, who is uh, worthy of promoting. <laughs> She's good. Um, listen, I, I just heard Benjamin speak about what I just was talking about. I didn't have a prepared statement. But the only thing he left out of there is, such a, is that it's a segregated community, Staten Island. And so that isolation is, is intentional and is by design. And anything that's not a it's uncomfortable to some of these Staten Islanders. They don't want to move forward. 
And there's been many projects and they keep blaming it on the project itself, but it's the people. The people don't back the projects because they don't fit the design of the segregation that's in these communities. I have some very good friends on here, but we need to be a little bit more authentic and be a little bit more vulnerable about the people. That young lady from Youth Bell, she was a prime example of giving the opportunity and, and a visual opportunity to see these, these high rises, what it might look like to maybe, you know, especially some of our neighbors like New Brighton and West Brighton, they've never seen the opportunities that exist. And if maybe with these three buildings and these, these, these outlets and this, this baseball field and this Jewish parking lot is not in, in service, there's an uh, opportunity. So I'm not coming at it from a zoning because the zoning is ridiculous. This has been for years, the same zoning and things change and people have to accept change and they don't want to accept change. Things are different now. There's diversity. There should be some inclusion in every area. I didn't, call, I didn't come to talk law because I'm working right now. I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Joseph Kakamo. And then we will try to get Stephanie Echeverrieta again. The next speaker, Joseph Kakamo. Starting time. Uh, council members, my name is Joe Kakamo. I'm speaking today in support of River North. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify about this important project. The developers behind River North have a record of actually de delivering on the proposals that they put forward. The proposals in particular include investments into the North Shore community that are sorely needed. With approximately 225 units of affordable housing, ample public open space and improved sidewalks and streetscape, River North will bolster the North Shore's status as a gateway to Staten Island and its many restaurants, retail and cultural institutions. Furthermore, I was pleased to hear about the part uh, partnerships that the River North team has formed as a part of this project. For instance, River North team is working with Building Skills New York to ensure Staten Islanders can access and be trained for construction jobs before, during, and after the development of River North projects. I was even more pleased to hear that the River North team is working with community organizations and stakeholders that I know and trust to ensure that these opportunities reach the people of Staten Island. Again, thank you for hearing my testimony today, and I urge you to vote in favor of River North. Thank you for your testimony today, Joseph. And now we'll just see if we can reach Stephanie Echeverrieta. Stephanie Echeverrieta, and forgive me for mispronouncing. Chair, please stand by and we'll see if we can bring her in. Thank you. Starting time. Hello. Hi, Stephanie, how are you? Hi, I apologize for that before. No, no worries. Good afternoon, um, members of the Zoning and Franchises Subcommittee. My name is Stephanie Echeverrieta, and I am here today in support of River North. As the program assistant for Youth Build Impact, I'm responsible for the management of the office, as well as to help support the students and their community service efforts. Because I work closely with them, I see the ways in which stable opportunities and resources can help change their lives. Our students are provided with change their lives, which, which build leadership, strengthen work ethics, and provide opportunities for critical thinking. This is why we need thoughtful partners who bring new housing, jobs, and community facilities to the area. This will allow our community to grow and flourish. Our borough, although sometimes forgotten, is a community of ambitious, aspirational youths and hardworking New Yorkers. We deserve to have a river north. It will fill a serious housing gap, providing apartments for those of varying income levels, including our youth and their families. It will also help spur local businesses, which means new jobs for our students and neighbors. These are not little things. This is how we change a generation's future, by showing them there is a community that supports them. I hope you will vote in favor, as I truly think this project will be an opportunity to help hundreds of Staten Island youth and young adults. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, is this the last panelist? Mr. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. Okay. Um, do we have any council members that wish to ask this panel any questions? No, Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, uh, there being no questions for this panel, the witness panel 
is now excused. And uh, council, if you can please call up the next panel. If there are any other members of the public at this time who wish to testify on the River North rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The chair of the meeting will uh, briefly stand at ease while we check for any additional members. Chair, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, um, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU numbers uh, 842, 843, and 844 for the River North rezoning proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, that concludes today's business and I will remind the main public uh, that for anyone wishing to submit written testimony uh, for items that were heard today, Please send it by emailing to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, Chair, pardon, pardon me before you uh, say the next thing. Um, we will, uh, with your permission, I'll just close the vote. Oh, I'm sorry. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, by a vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, the items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Great, and thank you. And with that, I would like to now uh, thank the members of the public, my colleagues, the subcommittee council, uh, land use and other council staff, as well as the Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's meeting. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you very much.